there's any other um, tech lab related questions that y'all have. Um, so to uh, thank, thank Pandora, um, but also uh, help kick us off, um, Eric Picard uh, from Pandora will be able to kind of give us a little welcome and, and set the, help set the tone for the day. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Eric. Hello, I'm Eric Picard. I'm Vice President of uh, Product Management for Advertising here at Pandora. Can I get a sense of the room? Who from the room is not from Pandora? Who are our guests today? That's great. That's really great. I was, uh, you, you never know when you host a, uh, an event over in Oakland, if you're gonna be able to pull people from the other side of the bay, who's gonna make the trip over. Lovely day here in Oakland, not quite as nice as it could be, but uh, we, we do our best. So thanks very much everybody for coming. Uh, I not only do I run ad product management here at Pandora, but I also am on the board of the IEB Tech Lab. So I can tell you a few things about the IEB Tech Lab uh, that might be of use and interest for the folks in the room. Uh, first of all, you should all be uh, going to the IEB Tech Lab website. I, I make a requirement for all the people on my teams that they're actually uh, participating in the various committees and forums of the IAB, not just because I think it's a good thing for the industry, but it's actually really good for their careers. So I, I think it's a really important thing. When I first started working in ad tech <clears throat> in 1997, um, the, the one of the very first things that I did was join a couple of IEB committees back in the day before the tech lab existed. And uh, some of those relationships that I created on things like I was part of the first impression guidelines committee um, or task force, whichever it was at the time, uh, some of those friendships I made professionally have become great personal friendships uh, that have lasted my whole career. And uh, I think it's a really valuable thing for uh, people in the industry to spend their time both helping the industry at large but also, again, making those connections that really will turn into something for your career, I think really important. Um, a, a couple things that are maybe worth note, you know, when I first started out in this space, uh, you know, it was at my own startup and, and we had about 40 engineers working and engineers and other product managers that reported to me would always be coming up to me asking like, what should I read? Where should I go? How do I learn? And there really wasn't much. So back in those days, I started writing a, uh, a monthly column just to write about ad tech because there really wasn't anything to read. Uh, even still today, it's mostly through the trade publications that you get sort of educated about what's going on in the industry. And the conferences that exist in this space have been much more oriented toward marketers and salespeople than they have been toward engineers and product managers. So one of the things that I, I took on uh, as a personal mission when I uh, started uh, being on the board of the Tech Lab was to really ask, can we really start some forums? Can we actually run a big industry conference for the technical people in this industry? Because there's really no place to send people. Um, so I'm really, really excited that we've started off with these smaller things first, and hopefully they'll blossom and grow into something much bigger. Uh, the IAB Tech Lab, just so that you're all clear, is separate from the IAB. They do share some DNA. They do share some the IAB funds, uh, part of the Tech Lab, but it's a global organization. So the IAB Tech Lab uh, is, as opposed to the IAB, IAB that we all know and love is actually the US organization. There are IABs all over the world. They are all, um, participating or for the most part participating in the IAB Tech Lab because it's actually super important that things like standards and the approaches that we take be the same across the globe, right? We can't have different fraud definitions and different different ways of thinking about measurement. So uh, welcome to Oakland for those of you who came from afar, told you I would do something like this to the people from Pandora. Uh, really happy to have you all here. Any other logistics that we need to hit before we kick this off? No. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, I'm actually also next. Um, uh, <laughs> um, by the way, speakers, we've got a handy clicker. Green means go. 
Um, yeah, so I'm Jennifer. I, uh, if you sign up for my working groups at Tech Lab, uh, you get 100 emails from me uh, in a year. <laughs> Um, we have uh, working groups, and I'm going to talk about what those are, what they look like, um, and just kind of set the set the uh, boring stuff, uh, get it out of the way. Um, so Ivy Tech Lab is a global consortium. Um, standards should be global. You got these cool got standards stickers, um, got milk. You know, do you get it? Uh, so. <laughs> um, the importance of having global standards is so that the companies who are um, needing to like communicate about GDPR consent can use the same signals uh, regardless of who's who's building what where. Um, and so anything like, you know, you look at like Apache Foundation or uh, Linux or any of these other open source projects, and I think we could probably draw a parallel to the need for that in ad tech. And so Ivy Tech Lab has played this role um, for the last almost a decade. Uh, it's been uh, really um, great to be able to watch our membership grow, to take on more projects that have more global impact. Um, we have working groups for basically each um, uh, specification uh, area. So the, the biggest one, and I think the one we've all kind of centered around, is the OpenRTB working group. Um, so for example, that group uh, has about 300, 400 people on the roster. Um, primarily engineers and uh, product leads. Um, and uh, there's usually each working group has a system of governance, whether that's co-chairs or commit groups. So for example, the OpenRTV working group has a commit group. There are eight um, tech leads on it. A few of them are in the room. Um, and then uh, the working group will have its own kind of cadence or project um, uh, timeline. Uh, whether there's a collection of proposals uh, or feature requests um, or bugs that need to be uh, um, kind of um, uh, updated at the same time, then we'll do like a whole iteration. So we just saw OpenRTB3, uh, that was a, a big um, rewrite of the specs. Um, but we've got some other uh, proposals that have come to life recently, so we'll talk about one of those later. So sellers.json. Um, and the supply chain objects, so we'll talk about what those look like. But basically, someone will come to the group, say, here's a problem, here's the way I think we can solve it. We'll spend a couple weeks talking about it. Um, maybe people are interested in it, maybe they aren't. Uh, and if there is a, a community need uh, to actually see um, that tech uh, come to fruition, then we'll probably go through a public comment period, usually 30 days. Anyone can email the group or uh, comment on GitHub, uh, and the working group will take that into consideration, and then we'll release the, the specification or the initiative and, uh, and push for adoption. So that's a pretty typical life cycle of most of the, the feature requests that come through. Um, some of the projects, like we'll talk about the Open Measure SDK, have a tighter, um, I believe even like sprint planning, like tighter uh, uh, life cycle track for all those feature requests. So depending on which group has a slightly different cadence. Um, and then a big part of uh, working with the uh, uh, community community standards creation is, uh, of course, adoption and making other people implement your really cool idea. Um, so we do things like this and get a bunch of eyeballs on projects um, or get press attention or um, do other kinds of efforts, blog posts, um, to get uh, adoption. Um, we also have tools and compliance and certification, um, or yeah, compliance at, uh, at Ivy Tech Lab. Um, so for example, uh, a tool that we've created that could help with ads.txt adoption is an ads.txt aggregator. So if you go to our website, go into the tools tab, you can learn about the ads.txt aggregator, which will just aggregate a bunch of content from the ads.txt files that publishers have posted. And that becomes an easier thing for, for buyers or any analytics provider to, uh, to just get that information right off the bat. Um, cool, okay. So uh, if you're not familiar, um, some of the like uh, initiatives or specification names that would come up um, in today's session and I might not have covered everything. The first bucket here is uh, a lot of the supply chain standards. And then um, we also have some other standards that are gonna be discussed or mentioned today. So OpenRTB is of course the real-time bidding protocol. Um, AdCom is the advertising common object model. AdsTXT is authorized digital sellers, text file for publishers to host listing who they allow, uh, what seller accounts are allowed to um, sell their data, we'll talk about that, or sell their uh, inventory, we'll talk about that. Um, Ads.cert, the underlying technology uh, for signed bid requests. 
um, and then sellers JSON supply chain object. We'll talk about all of these. Uh, but we'll also talk about the open measurement SDK, OM SDK, vast video ad serving template, and then um, just another thing, for example, that the Tech Lab works on is uh, the IB Europe Transparency Consent Framework, which helps with GDPR compliance. So we'll, all of these things are up for grabs, and just so we have those uh, right off the bat. And then uh, let's dive in. Uh, our first uh, presentation is um, Jayesh uh, from Pandora. Welcome, Jayesh. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Jayesh, and uh, I work on the ads architecture team at Pandora. I've been here nine years, and before that, I was at a company called NextSage, uh, which built early stage mediation and stuff, now what's called an SSP. Uh, and at Pandora, I think we have a lot of uh, proprietary systems that we built over time. Uh, and one of the reasons being we were probably ahead of our times for, in terms of ad technology, uh, like going back 10 years. Uh, and what I'm going to highlight here is uh, some of the challenges that we face and some of the areas we look up to IAB Tech Lab to see where the standards fit in and how our roadmap aligns with all of the standards that are coming out. Um, and again, uh, when I was asked to speak at this event like two weeks ago, I was in the middle of planning a trip to Disney because same time next week, I am in Disneyland. So if my slides seem a little off or you know, if I am incoherent a little bit, just you know, cut me some slack. Uh, again, uh, let's move into the slides. <laughs> I have three slides, so I'll be very brief and I'll let Hammond take over after. So let's see how it goes. So, Again, I think most of the people in this room are pretty familiar that the whole ads ecosystem has tons of players in it, and that's one of the reasons the IAB Tech Lab exists. So you can define how these people interact. So we put a slide together. Again, this is not my slide. We put, we put together, and I'm just going to flow through this. Uh, the idea is to represent the parties involved. One is the advertisers on my right and publishers on the left, and the idea is yeah, that's a good point. Some people represent the other way around. I don't know what the standard is. Maybe IAB should, IAB, there you go. <laughs> so the idea here is that the arrows, kind of the big arrows up there on the top represent like the dollars flowing. That's where the money flows. And advertisers are the ones who are spending all the money and they want some kind of an ROI. And they have to go through all these systems and each of the system and people who build those systems expect to take a slice out of that dollar. And then eventually, publishers get paid whatever it is that they get paid. And, and again, the idea is that this is a complex ecosystem. And uh, some of the tools in here we built in-house at Pandora as well. Uh, and uh, as part of our ads with acquisition of late, we are trying to make a play for programmatic as well. Uh, so let's go into the Pandora's ad buying system. So I'm, I'm going to break this into two parts. One is the ad buying and the other side is the ad delivery. So I'm going to break it up into two parts. Ad buying system, what Pandora usually does is mostly direct sold ads. Programmatic is kind of relatively new for audio. We did display programmatic a long time ago and then we transitioned video to programmatic. Audio is still uh, nascent and AdsWiz is where that comes into picture. So in our ecosystem for ad buying, we've built, the yellow boxes here represent what we have, uh, what we built. And the purple ones and non-yellow ones are external systems. Uh, so we have an internal system for, called the OMS. I think it's, it's I, I've oversimplified it by putting in one box, there's like uh, 10, 15 different services that contribute to that order management system. Uh, it's primarily based for, it's, it's primarily uses for direct sold ads that we have a large sales team that comes back to engineering every quarter and says, can you give us more inventory? Can we give us more inventory? Because they're super awesome at doing their job. And what we are doing right now is there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a limit to scaling that org and getting the inventory that they want. And there's still unsold left on the table, which, uh, which what, what we uh, used to do at uh, ad network or you know remnants. And what we're doing with uh, additional inventory that we generate is we're going to have programmatic as well fill in. So we're, we're expanding our pipes in such a way that we can leverage direct sold and programmatic. And programmatic because I think we've, we've seen market demand where um, advertisers are buying programmatic for display and audio. And they're like, when can we do audio programmatic? 
And so what we've did with AdsWiz acquisition is we we kind of opened up our pipes to programmatic audio as well. And so we we have two systems. One is the programmatic OMS, which is uh, all the AdsWiz ecosystem where we still do kind of direct deals with the advertiser, but they transact programmatically. So we have a system that kind of configures all of their deals and supply packs or whatever the terms are, right? So, so we have two paths. One is direct sold, the other is programmatic. And that's the buying system. And a uh, couple of things I highlight there in the lines are open direct is an API spec from IAB Tech Lab that we kind of evaluated when we built an API for broadcast buying on RIO. And VAS standards is what we are going towards uh, for all of our uh, ad payloads that come from that server to our ecosystems. And all the other lines don't have any standards. It's all built based on our spec and our APIs and our definitions. And if you go to the ad delivery side, it's a, it's the flip, it's the other side of the system where uh, we traditionally use DFP to serve our ads. Our DFP is now called Google Ad Manager. Um, and we had our Pandora backend uh, mediating all of these ad requests and transforming payloads for all of our clients. So we have web, mobile, and a bunch of CE devices. And CE devices are something that we don't control or change the implementation often. So we want a consistent payload going back to for backwards compatibility and stuff. So we have everything going through our backends. And again, these represent challenges in adoption of a standard because you know you, there's always backwards compatibility. If you look at mobile, if, if anybody here is a mobile engineer, you always know that there's an app version out there that doesn't support anything that's you know vast. And so you would still translate vast to an older payload. So we have all that logic in our backends. And again, uh, Google Ad Manager, this only represents direct sold. And what happened over the last couple of, last year maybe is we put AdsWiz in there and said, okay, AdsWiz is a source for our programmatic. And Pandora Mediation now has ability to consume a vast audio ad. And this is around the time when vast uh, adopted audio standards as well. I think they killed DAST and now it's all in one vast. Vast stands for video ad serving template, but it also does audio now. So there's, I hope there's no renaming of that standard to something, anyways. Um, let's go to another one. So again, there's another interesting play at Pandora. One was the programmatic, so ads with acquisition. The other one is if you're following some news uh, about how, how Pandora sales team is uh, trying to take on SoundCloud inventory as well. So what we did was uh, like I said, our, our sales team is awesome at selling, and they are like looking for inventory to sell. And one of the one of the uh, interesting business partnership that we did with SoundCloud was that, uh, you know, hey SoundCloud, if you can come on our platform and let our sales team sell an audio package that serves on Pandora and SoundCloud, you know, it benefits both of us. So that's where uh, SoundCloud comes in, and they have their own backend proprietary transformations to payloads to their mobile and web clients. And what, this, what all these integration made us realize is that, uh, you know, being a closed ecosystem is not something that allows us to move forward with such partnerships. And uh, as part of our technology roadmap, and as Eric Picard was mentioning, is that we are opening up our internal systems to think about how standards can be applied to all of the lines that we have there that doesn't have a standard today. And uh, one of the things that we encourage mobile engineers and uh, backend engineers to do at Pandora here is try and explore if there's a standard that we can adopt in terms of, you know, that gives us long-term uh, benefits versus finding a solution that's more short-term and, you know, more closed ecosystem in a way. Um, and then the next slide, this is my last slide and I'll shut up. So. Again, uh, I want to highlight some of the challenges. Uh, like I said, uh, video, uh, we still do server to server. We've adopted IMA SDK. We've done a viewability OM SDK contribution and implementation. Uh, audio is still kind of nascent. There's, we still do a server to server, and there's also confusion between whether it's a server to server or SSAI. Uh, and I'm not sure what the distinction between two is. In my mind, the distinction is that you know if you're if you're inserting the audio ad in the server, stitching and audio, that's SSAI. The other one is just a server-to-server -server ad request, and you still do expect the client to play the ad and insert it into the stream. Uh, and there's also work going on with audibility, which is an equivalent to viewability. I think there's another uh, tech group that's defining those standards, and I guess it'll come to ad, 
uh, this tech lab to define probably an implementation protocol or how it affects VAST or anything like that. So I'm hoping that will all flush out in the next year or so maybe. Um, and again, display, we have uh, implemented recently, rolled out GMA SDK, and hopefully that will solve all of our problems uh, with viewability and measurements and unifying all that stuff. Uh, and one of the main things we have uh, as, a, as a kind of core competency in, in Pandora is we have uh, kind of brand safety. I think people, advertisers come to Pandora expect, uh, you know, content to be clean. We, we have flags in place that don't play ads on certain, you know, non -ex uh, kind of explicit content. We have comedy on there. We have we are launching podcasts. So we're being very careful with where ads play, and that's one of the uh, things that advertisers, I think, buy into as well when they say play an ad on Pandora or buy X number of dollars. They expect it to play in certain, uh, you know, non-explicit and certain, um, you know, inventory. Uh, and as part of programmatic, I think we also did the ads.txt. Uh, I think we, you will hear about rewarded ads, which is something that we have an in-house product and we are looking at uh, IAB Tech Labs and other companies to contribute and kind of standardize that feature uh, where you unlock a reward when you watch or when you hear uh, an ad. And it's, 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 pretty, it's proven pretty high value. You'll see in the next couple of uh, slides that Andrew is going to present. Uh, and the last bullet item there is I just put it on there because I think blockchain makes slides look pretty. So I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I, I think I read something. There's also an initiative somewhere going on about blockchain and IAB Tech Lab. So I'm just calling it out there. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. And thank you. Yes, blockchain. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Hammond, and I've worked on the ad side at Pandora for six plus years at this point. Um, but I've worked a lot with rewarded ads during that time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the rewarded ad products that exist at Pandora, uh, why and how we build them, and standard opportunities in the supply chain for rewarded ads specifically. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three rewarded ad products first. Uh, and then get into kind of the, the why and the how we build them. So sponsor listening was actually our first foray into rewarded ads. And what we were trying to solve for is a complaint that the ad load had gotten progressively higher on the platform and we were having retention issues due to that. So the value exchange here is Advertiser, you're going to pay for an hour of listening for the user, uh, but we're going to you know, give you credit for that placement. Uh, so we start with the display trigger. This reward ad product uh, either shows a video or it has them go through an HTML5 based activity. Uh, the video and the activity are enforced, so they have to complete at least 15 seconds or complete the activity. And at the end, they unlock this reward. There is a persistent banner that calls out the advertiser during the duration. And bookending it, we also have uh, messages, uh, visual and audio, crediting the, the, the uh, advertiser. So you can see we really went out of our way to, to kind of put the advertiser in the, in the listener's mind. And the result was, this is five years ago at this point, the result was that users we're tweeting out thanks to the advertisers for their uninterrupted hour. So if, if you build an ad product and people tweet recognition, you're doing, you're doing a good job. And it, it, it tells the value that opt-in rewarded ad formats can have. Uh, this was built on a completely proprietary manner. Uh, and, and so it's, We've evolved over time to be more standards orientated, uh, but this one was completely proprietary. Later on, uh, we addressed another user complaint, the skip limit. It used to be that you could have only so many skips in an hour, and then you were locked. You just had to listen. So what could we do? We can, you know, the skips had a cost. They altered Pandora's cost structure. So we got some rights to deliver extra skips. We put a video ad um, 
instead of a sort of a, an opt-in rewarded video ad instead of that skip limit. So the user hits skip and in stage one, stage two, they get a coach mark says, hey, want some more skips? Opt into watching a video. Three is an enforced video ad. And four, they've unlocked the extra skips. So now they have a bucket of skips to pass um, to use. And really they have unlimited skips at this, po at this point. We've addressed the user need. Uh, we've associated a reward to the advertiser and really solved this problem. Uh, let's see here, moving on to number three, premium access. The premium access was created in response to user complaints that the free tier of Pandora was radio only and we, don't, we can't play a track, we can't play an album, we can't hear what I want. So we had built a premium product but it was only available from subscriptions. So here we're addressing the need of essentially free on-demand playback, although that's not how we build it externally. You want to hear that album? Great. Search for the album, find the album in a backstage page, in a catalog page, click it, again, an opt-in prompt, followed by an enforced 15 seconds of video, and finally that unlocks actually the premium tier for a number of minutes for you to enjoy that, that album. So why opt-in rewarded ads? So what we found studying standard autoplay video uh, was that they had a high a negative uh, retention impact. So they annoyed and disengaged our viewers. Uh, their message actually wasn't well heard. And uh, when we, we did um, science experiments where we varied audio and video load, different ratios of them, uh, and it, it was good science, and it showed us that the retention impact of video, at least on our platform, the way we had implemented APV, was six times worse than audio ads. So when we rearranged this equation into a value exchange and into a rewarded ads, what we saw is that a much more engaged viewer, partially because they're receiving a reward, so it's psychologically different, and partially because there is enforcement around this um, that prevents them from backgrounding the app or, or doing anything. They really have to complete, it will pause and wait for you to come back. Um, so at least we guaranteed that the advertiser is really getting 15 seconds of their attention. So that, that delivered high value, uh, both for the attention and for the psychological association of good feels that I'm, I'm getting some higher value um, out of the app. Uh, the same, APV that would have had a terrible retention impact when it's used in a rewarded format actually has a positive retention impact that the, the value exchange that we created, giving the user access to premium content uh, or extra skips or a reduced ad load, uh, completely turned it around. Uh, and at the same time, we're increasing our video inventory. Uh, so retention positive and more video. So how does it work? Uh, how we build it today at Pandora is that we, we identify a trigger. So there's some kind of native interaction that the user is doing. It's the skip button or, or whatnot, or the, the native content. Uh, the opt-in is a cross-platform coach mark, so it's HTML defined, and we, we serve it to all the clients. The vast is uh, migrating to all vast encoded video. The viewability portion is basically a, the client enforcement I discussed where we, we have a, a UI that, and features if they background the apps and, and such that make sure that they see the 15 seconds of advertiser message in, in order to receive the reward. Uh, we have a value exchange service that associates the rewards with the user session. And I just want to go over sort of the demand sources and supply sources here. Uh, Video Plus is a direct sold, opt-in, rewarded only ad product. And it generates five to six times the yield of standard APV for us. Next, this is, a, this is waterfall through, through the categories. Next we have APV. Uh, this is our direct sold version of it. And programmatic video uh, through an open, through edX, through an open exchange. And finally, house ads uh, kind of end the waterfall over demand sources. On the supply side, I've 
sort of covered out here what, what the native interactions are for sponsored listening. It's the display ad location, um, kind of where the album art is. And it's an offer to essentially you know, reduce your ad load. Extra skips, obviously, it's the skip button interaction once you've hit that limit. Replays, anytime you hit the replay button. And for premium access, any kind of on-demand content that you interact with uh, via search and catalog pages. And more is coming. This has been so effective um, that we're looking to expand it. So the takeaways are that it's a win-win-win. It's a win for the advertiser. It's a win for the listener. And it's a win for the publisher as well. Uh, in, just to talk about, uh, in, there's a case study out there, um, Chick-fil-A, in the sponsored listening use case, we, the same, the same sort of ad product that people are tweeting out there, in zip codes where they were showing that ad product, they got a 69% lift in in-store visits. And that generated a $1.3 million worth of revenue from that ad campaign for them, from those in-store visits. So it works for the advertiser. The, the good feels around the rewards do matter. The advertiser has little to no effort if they're using standard vast encoded video ads, but the burden kind of relies on the publisher. So the trigger, the opt-in, the reward, all those things have to be built out in a way that makes sense for the type of content and the cost structure the costs that the, the, pen, the publisher is, is supporting. Uh, it's lower friction than subscriptions. How many people have visited new sites that are asking for $1 a month subscriptions? All right. How many people have subscribed? OK. So what if they just wanted 15 seconds of your attention to unlock three articles. How many people would do that? OK. So it's lower friction than subscriptions. It also drives subscriptions. Once you let people taste your content, your, your premium services, they, may be, they are more interested in subscribing. And premium access has really driven subscriptions here at Pandora. So regarding standards, uh, part of what we can do is simply educate and motivate. There's a publication by the IB Tech Lab entitled Opt-in Value Exchange Advertising Playbook for Brands, and it's out in de from December 2018. It's great for brands, but it's actually also great for publishers to raise awareness of the type of value that, that can be unlocked with this. Uh, AdComes 1.0 supports rewarded placement for programmatic ads. This is, this is great. This creates a demand pool within programmatic that should help motivate publishers, and we need to communicate out uh, this existence. But this is, this is maybe an initial step, and I, th I think we should all ask ourselves what we can do to further motivate advertisers and publishers to participate in opt-in value exchange style ads. We need to create from the advertiser pool, they want to understand how, what, what good feels are they generating for the listener or from the user, uh, how much brand lift or what other goal that they have is likely to get out of this type of value exchange. And so things, and then on the publisher side, of course, it's, you know, what's, how much am I going to get paid for this? Is there a higher value pool? What do I have to do? in order to gain access to higher value um, programmatic demand sources. So we should talk about reward type categories, or we should ask ourselves, are there standards around reward type categories or reward thresholds or measurement standards or activity types that can help drive higher value demand pools and help motivate each side to participate? Uh, you know, the reward type categories is, is, is this premium content? Is this a lower ad lo or an, an ad free period? Is this some kind of tokens to use um, in a purchase sort of manner? The reward threshold, you know, are there standards that we should have for the time or, or how many steps in an activity? Measurement standards, you know, we have existing measurement standards, but does rewarded 
ads change that in any way. And then activity types, you know, we can simply transform a video into a rewarded experience, but maybe there's room for standards around things like surveys. Is it, you know, is there a, you don't want to have an unending sort of survey chain in front of a listener, but if there was a three-step survey standard, maybe that would be more useful to, to participate in. So, uh, yeah, in closing, the, there's a huge amount of value. You can really transform the impact of ads, and we should all be discussing how standards can help make that a more common experience. Thanks. I have a question. Um, nope, I think it's coming now. There we go. So I have a question. Do all the rewards, are they all like one size fits all? Or do you have something that like varies the rewards using some kind of a variable reward engine that might exist? And, and if so, why did you do that, and, and how did you come to the conclusion that you might want to do something like that? I actually think that it's a little leading, but I think people in the audience might find it interesting. Yeah, so we have what Picard is referencing is that when we first offered some of the rewards, they all had sort of fixed reward durations, and we built a variable reward engine, and this was motivated because we, you know, for several reasons. There's the cost structure so, and that we have, so we're trying to balance with that. But we also, we did, again, science, we did an experiment where we varied the reward durations uh, in, in different pools of users and took a look at the retention and other benefits that we saw from those uh, experimental treatments. And we learned a lot from that, and we we applied it, and it wasn't it wasn't the same against all groups of users. So we decided to take advantage of that science, understand the cost structure, which is also not the same. You know, advertisers are not targeting all groups of users the same. So our cost or our, the the value that we're getting from the ads is not the same. So. Yes, we, we do vary the reward durations uh, across the user base. So Pandora would be interested, okay, we want to be empowering the publisher to deal with their cost structure and deal with how the uh, users benefit from the various rewards. And so when we look at standards, we don't want to lock people into any kind of fixed uh, reward offering. We do want to retain the power in the publisher's hands to be able to balance that for themselves. Uh, but it's these have been great learnings, and it really it's you know it's important for every publisher to be empowered to be able to create the right balance for their listeners, for their cost structure, for the income that they're getting on monetization. Hey, th uh, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, do you do you cash any of the um, creative? And if if so, when is all the ad calling happening? At the start of the app, or is it happening in real time? As you decide. Yeah. So, on the mobile clients, the caching strategy is a little bit different for mobile and, and web. But on the mobile clients, we cache basically on startup the opt-in. Uh, UI so that we can uh, give that to the user in a very performant way. And as soon as that opt-in pops up, we begin downloading, we optimistically begin caching the video as well. Uh, what we, for premium access, has am amazing sort of funnel stats. The people that, of people that click on premium content, 80% of them say yes to do you want to watch a video ad to continue to, to get access to this. And of the people who begin watching the video ad, 90% complete. So our, 
as soon as we show that initial UI, our optimistic strategy, you know, is well founded in in, in the stats that we have. Um, but we are we are in general very conscious of the performance of the mobile UI. Um, the web has a little bit less pre-caching because of the lower latency on the web. Um, but we, we do make a large effort to pre-cache whatever is possible. Sorry, and then when you cache, are you caching on Wi-Fi only or do you cache on a carrier network? Uh, we cache regardless. So we, we don't have a lot of different, other than um, like you're caching your offline media for playback, we don't discriminate a lot between Wi-Fi and cellular on the Pandora app. Other questions? Great, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Um, up next, wait, do you have the clicker? Hey, <laughs> thank you so much, you guys. That's very helpful, I think, to understand kind of uh, the ad tech industry, how, how, how things work, why we're trying to, uh, to get real-time bidding between the advertisers and the publishers, um, and then reward it as such a great example of some of the innovative things you can do with cool ad formats and why standards matter and getting that to a broader scale across the industry. Um, one of the next things that we're gonna talk about is uh, ads, app ads TXT, which is bringing the uh, brand safety concerns from, uh, from the ads TXT initiative to the in-app world. And um, our friends Curtis Light and Per Bjorka from Google are gonna help talk about the, uh, the app ads TXT initiative. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me okay? Cool. So I'm Per and this is Curtis. So, clicker, yeah. How many of you are familiar with ads.txt? Quite a few, okay, excellent. I'll do a quick recap, a quick intro, uh, but I'll go through it fast. If I skip something that's interesting, let me know and we can go through it in more detail. So, quick overview first, then we'll talk about app ads.txt uh, and go into the how-to for all of the different constituents. We have about 500 slides, so we'll go through them a little bit fast. Um, first, how are you? So ads.txt is all about addressing counterfeit inventory. Counterfeit isn't anything unique to ads. It exists everywhere. How many of you have a fake Rolex? I bought one in Tijuana back in like 25 years ago for about 15 bucks. Probably wasn't real. Um, but counterfeit inventory is a big problem. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a couple of slides. And ads.txt is all about allowing you to authorize who's selling your inventory. So if you are Rolex, imagine you could, Rolex could post on a website that you can buy real Rolex on Amazon through this seller, on eBay through this seller, and in, in these stores. That's a way to at least know that you're buying through an authorized seller. Doesn't guarantee that the, what you get is guaranteed but at least the money goes to an authorized seller. So why should we declare? Why is this a problem? Why do we need this? Some of you have probably seen these stories. This was from about two years ago. Financial Times did a study. They found Financial Times had two authorized sellers, two exchanges and two accounts for display. They didn't sell any video through programmatic. When they did, they did a study in 2017, they found they had, if I remember correctly, on video about 15 exchanges and 300 sellers. They didn't sell anything, any video programmatically. 15 exchanges and 300 sellers. They calculated about 1.3 million in loss every month. So we're talking about significant money here. This is just one publisher. Guardian, we did a study with Guardian. We found that 72% of all video spend that advertisers thought was going to Guardian never went to Guardian, 72%. So it's clearly very, very significant, especially in video. I know if you heard about the Eve case that we worked on with White Ops and the FBI takedown that happened back in, uh, in uh, Q4. In early 2018, of all of the inventory that they sold, all the fake inventory, fake traffic they sold, 
of anything that was from domains that they, they faked about the 10,000 domains. And you see most of that was unauthorized. There were some authorized and that was either because they visited uh, legitimate sites to look normal or they were doing traffic selling. So clearly there's a big potential here for trying to clean this up. So let's do a quick check on, on the segmentation for ad statistics. So when you segment, when you look at ad statistics, whether something is authorized, you get three segments of inventory. You have the participating pubs and you have the ones who are not participating. The ones who are not participating, well, you don't know anything more than you did before. You don't know what's authorized or not. If Rolex doesn't post anything on their website about where you can buy Rolex, well, then you don't know anything more. However, if Rolex is posting where you can buy the real Rolex, and this guy down in Tijuana is not listed on that, well, then I know that that's not authorized. While if I go to the store at the mall that's listed, then I know that's authorized. Same thing here. You have authorized, unauthorized, and then you have the unknown. And now what are we trying to do here? So there's four levels of enforcement that you can think of here. And the same thing applies for the mobile that we talk about in a second. So first, you stop buying the unauthorized. No brainer, right? If you know something is not authorized, you don't want to trade it. But do you want to still buy non-participating? If Pandora hasn't published their mobile app as a TXT file yet, are you still going to buy Pandora? Yeah. You've got to give people the time to adopt. So that's for level two and three. These are for buy-side platforms like DSPs, like ourselves and, and Judd from Trade Desk and so forth. You can choose to give options where you say, advertiser, you can choose to only buy a authorized or choose not to buy a, a non-participating. So you have those options and you may expose them in the UI. Not all products do, but you can. And then at the end, we want to only buy uh, authorized. No one should transact non-participating or unauthorized in the end. That's how we can really secure it. So what does it look like? Level one, you cut out the red stuff, non-controversial. Two, you give advertiser option to exclude the non-participating. Now I don't want to buy Pandora until you publish the ad statistics file. Three, you switch the default and you say you have to opt in to buy non-participating. And four, you cut out all of the bad stuff and unknown stuff. Any questions on this? So let's talk about uh, appifying ad statistics today. So for the last two years, ad statistics applied to the web, mobile and desktop web, but not apps. And the reason was that there were, there were a unique challenge for apps. The key challenge for apps was global namespace. When you look at a domain, it's a global namespace. You know what domain it is. Imagine if you try to use ads.txt for domains without having the, yes, the um, suffix, without .com or whatever it is. You don't really know who it is. If you look at Pandora app on different app stores, it may not be the same app. It may not even be Pandora's app, even if it's labeled Pandora on some app store. So you have to have global namespace. Other than that, it's pretty much all the same. Same concept, slightly different how you find and publish the information. But the concept is the same. Exactly the same concept. Uh, so for this part of the talk, I'll talk about uh, the design principles that we had behind appads.txt and then also uh, uh, how to go about actually implementing it on your platforms or as a, uh, as a publisher or as a buyer. So uh, one of the... Uh, one of the things I want to talk about are the design principles we had behind this spec. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this spec was going to be an open standard that would be uh, easy to uh, have automated discovery for any platform that wanted to adopt this. Uh, when you first start thinking about mobile applications, you think, oh, well, we've got Apple, we've got uh, Google Play Store, and a few others. But there's a wide variety of uh, app stores that are uh, on many, many different platforms. And that isn't just limited to mobile applications. We've got connected TV app stores like Roku or Samsung. We've got a um, variety of uh, app stores for installed apps on uh, platforms like uh, Steam, uh, uh, Windows Store. We wanted to make an, a standard here that was very open to any participating app store being able to uh, easily adopt this. 
and so I'll talk about um, uh, how we tried to, to accomplish that with this with the standard. Uh, we're using the exact same format as the as.txt spec, so it's just a uh, different file name, um, but it's a, a, the, the same underlying format, so it's easy for the platforms that are currently um, uh, implementing this to uh, uh, add support for this to the platform. And it's also aligned with the other uh, initiatives like ads.cert and other, um, uh, other IAB uh, Tech Lab initiatives. So to give you an idea um, of how this uh, uh, covers all of the inventory through all of the sources, let's take uh, the Pandora app, for instance. Uh, for instance. Pandora app is published in Play Store, on uh, iTunes Store, there's a Roku app, there's a variety of other connected TV apps. All of those are need to be covered under an identity umbrella of the Pandora.com uh, website. And so what we're hoping to accomplish is to have a standard where the identity of the developer of the app and the, uh, is, is going to be uh, first class and is, a, uh, uh, is able to cover all of the variety of distribution platforms that that app could be distributed through. So publishing uh, an app ads.txt file on pandora.com will cover all of the um, distribution channels that use uh, that uh, domain as the developer uh, website for the app stores that it's uh, associated with. So uh, what one of the ways that we work to create a uh, global namespace for apps is we, uh, we created a set of meta tags that are uh, that are published by the app stores. So right now, for example, if you go and look at the source code behind uh, Google Play Store, you'll see for all the apps in the Play Store, we've got these uh, app store meta properties that are uh, published and they show the um, bundle ID and store ID for uh, the, uh, the apps published in the Google Play Store. And if there's any developer URL associated with that app, it is also listed there in the in the meta tags. And so the principle behind this is that if anyone wants to come along and create a new app store, then there's a way to have that app store automatically discovered. You don't have to have um, uh, each participant in the apps uh, app verification go out and uh, do something custom for new app stores. As long as they're willing to buy from those app stores, they're able to, um, uh, to crawl these standard tags and get the metadata in a standardized fashion. So the overview of uh, the process. So uh, you first start by discovering, if you're a buyer, you'd find uh, relevant inventory that you want to buy. So Pandora um, uh, inventory for, uh, available programmatically. Uh, then for the various app stores, uh, you, you would most likely use a, um, a crawling solution that is aggregating this on behalf of, um, uh, of, of other, um, uh, other companies to go out and crawl um, the, uh, the stores and then uh, go and crawl the app as.txt files from the publisher's websites. And then once that information is aggregated and available, it can be uh, used for real-time enforcement on serving platforms. So uh, for developers, um, so in, uh, for example, in the Play Store, uh, we're using the uh, contact information for the app to, uh, uh, to point to the developer's website. So um, for example, on, on the Play Store app, there is a visit website link under um, the developer. And so this is where we get, uh, for uh, all of the participants, this is where you'd have access to the underlying developer website for um, the, this particular app. Now, I, uh, I modified the URL uh, that was, was used here uh, a bit for, for the example, but basically what we're doing is we're standardizing the uh, canonicalization of the developer URL so that the uh, that we replace whatever path is in the URL with appads.txt and we've got a scheme for uh, canonicalizing the domain 
that uh, the that uh, the appads.txt file is uh, looked up from, and uh, that's all uh, in, uh, uh, explained more detail in the spec. So before before you move on, for the web, it's easy to know where to find the file, right? If you get a bid request coming from Pandora.com, you go to pandoracom txt. But for a mobile app, this is how we do that instead, right? If you go back one slide, so. In, you don't have a domain necessarily when you get a bid request from an app. So there has to be a mapping to the location of the statistics file for apps. And that's where we use the web developer in the uh, respective app stores. So it's just a way of finding a way that the developer controls, points to a web location, and then the file can be hosted there. So nothing more magic about it. Yeah, and one of the goals behind this standard, one of the design principles we had is we want to make it so that anyone can, uh, that is, it's open and transparent, anyone can go to these stores and be able to see the underlying information that was used to drive these um, developer website links. Um, so once that information is obtained, uh, or once the, the developer has uh, decided the domain that they're going to be publishing an app at, that text file at, uh, then they just use the standard app uh, ads text file format where you list the domain of the ad tech platform uh, followed by a publisher ID uh, uh, that you have the account uh, on that platform and whether or not it's a direct relationship that a publisher has with the platform or if there's a reseller relationship. Uh, and then there's a uh, fourth field that's an optional uh, tag ID. So before we go into the platforms, so when we talk about buyers, buyers can mean two different things. The buyers can mean the advertiser agencies, or it can buy, mean the buy side platforms. In this case, we're talking about the people who are doing the enforcement. That's all the platforms, whether sell side, intermediary, exchange, DSPs, and so forth, buy side platforms. Not the advertiser or agencies who get an aggregated report, but the platforms who are doing the, the work for them. So just to make that clear. Uh, so on a program, uh, and yeah, we skipped that one. Go back one more time. Oh. The um, some people may say that it's only buy side platform like the DSPs who should enforce ads to TXT. That's not the case, right? Everyone has to do their part to enforce it. If something can, fake can't be sold, well, no one can buy it. So it's much better to start early on in the supply chain. If everyone networks, SSPs, exchanges, everyone enforce this, even if there's a buyer who does not enforce ads.txt, it won't be transacted. So this, everyone has to agree here and accept that everyone needs to do this enforcement. And the early stage uh, players in the, in the flow have more ability to check stuff than the last guys do. So an SSP or an ad network can do things that the DSP couldn't do because they have a closer relationship. They can check on direct versus reseller status and stuff like that. So let's make it very clear. Everyone needs to enforce. So uh, when uh, any participant receives a uh, open RTP request uh, the, for mobile app uh, for connected TV, one of the fields that is available in uh, that request is a store URL. Uh, that's part of the uh, inventory quality guideline standards about uh, uh, what fields need to be supplied in an open RTP request. So from that information, this gives you the discovery entry point to know what app store URLs to go out and crawl. And it's what makes the standard uh, be able to automate discovery of, um, of apps. Yeah, so this is where we solve the, uh, this is what solved the global namespace, right? If you have Angry Bird, you don't know where Angry Bird came from if you have a bid request from Angry Bird, unless you look at the story world. Because it could be Angry Bird from uh, Play, it could be Angry Bird from uh, Amazon or from uh, a bunch of other Samsung and a bunch of other app stores. So you have to look at the story URL to be able to get that global namespace. So um, now the app stores, uh, we strongly encourage all of the app stores to be able to uh, implement these uh, meta tags on the behalf of the publishers on that platform because the meta tags make it very easy to parse that HTML content and uh, gain access to that structured data 
uh, that uh, that allows the crawlers to be able to uh, to use this structured data in an automated fashion. Um, it's it, per the spec, it is not required or mandated uh, to actually go out and crawl the store. If there is an alternative source of uh, this metadata that uh, would provide the equivalent information that can be used, but we strongly encourage all of the app stores to uh, participate in, uh, in the standard by implementing the standard uh, meta tags. So once that developer URL is obtained, uh, then there is a canonicalization algorithm uh, that is listed in the spec, and we've got a, a reference implementation uh, open source for that will uh, take the domain, uh, uh, chops it up into the uh, uh, underlying domain, and adds on the app adds that text extension. And that's how it goes out uh, and knows how to go out and uh, find the app as that text file. We also support subdomains, but only one level depth of subdomain uh, to make it very predictable about where the file will be located for a given app. And so finally, once uh, that uh, one, once that authoritative link between a uh, bundle or store identifier uh, in that particular app store is identified to a developer domain, then uh, the platform is able to enforce the authorized sellers by uh, uh, by doing a in memory lookup uh, at serving time to find whether or not uh, the request is being received from an authorized um, uh, authorized participant. And just in case you wonder, there's a test at the end of the day, and make sure you got all those details for the last four slides. Okay, buyers. So what should the, the buyers and agencies do? Do they have a role? Do they have a job? So they don't have access to the data, right, typically. They don't have access to the bid request and all the detailed data. So they can't do much analysis on their own. They can't do enforcement. But they hold the purse. They uh, sit on the money bag. So they need to lean in and influence heavily. So they need to be aware. They need to get involved. And then they need to define policies. What po criteria do you have as a buyer? Do you want to buy non-participating? Do you want to buy only authorized? What's your policy? You've got to make sure that you define that. But the most important thing they have is they need to engage with publishers. They need to engage with us uh, tech companies and lean in and make this a requirement. Because they can make this happen much faster than anyone else. So it's key that we get the WFA, the ANA, the 4As, and all these guys on, on board and lean in. And they are. They are very positive to this. Uh, but all advertisers and agencies need to play an important role here. A couple of reminders. This is probably going to be in, uh, in one or the other trade publication story at some point in the near future. Oh, someone abused ads, app ads.txt. It didn't solve all fraud problems. It didn't solve world hunger or stuff like that. Well, gee, it isn't a silver bullet. It doesn't remove invalid traffic. I can still create as much invalid traffic as I want to and sell it and pretend to be New York Times. There's nothing stopping me from selling New York Times inventory. But I can't get paid unless I have a bad intermediary that's in cahoots with me. So it does not stop invalid traffic, but it removes the monetary incentive unless you're really good and really aligned with someone as an intermediary. You cannot get paid. And the fraudsters, what are they looking for? Money. They want a Porsche, they want a house in uh, French Riviera and so forth. Money. If you take the money away, they stop. So it's all about the money. And we follow the money. So it isn't this, it's, it's not a silver bullet, but it's extremely, extremely useful. It's been the biggest game changer in fighting ad fraud in the history of, of adver online advertising. Another thing. As a publisher, be careful of whose information you put in there. If this guy with the, uh, in uh, the jacket full of Rolex outside on the street here is telling you to put his information on your authorized seller, uh, probably don't believe him. If you get an uh, unsolicited email or phone call from some network you don't know about and say, hey, yeah, there's to your ads or TXT and monetization is going to go up, uh, probably don't do it. 
If you have a partner that has 10,000 entries in their file, ask, ask you to add them to your file. If you have 10,000 items in your list, how the heck do you check that you get paid from those 10,000 items? This is money, this is accounting, this is stuff you need to check, so be careful. And it's important that everyone participate, even long tail. It's important that everyone uh, participate. You know why? I've had a few discussions internally about this. Ah, oh, long tail is not subject to this. Domain spoofing happens for the big brands. People spoof, people counterfeit Rolex, they may not counterfeit my, my little Casio watch here. Well, guess what? When you block them on the premium domains, they go down the funnel. And what's more, agencies are going to look for simple solutions. The big agencies are going to just say, hey, we're only going to buy authorized. If you're not participating, you're going to lose out. Even if you are not the risk factor, you're going to lose out because a lot of people are only going to buy authorized, meaning participating. So everyone needs to participate for the greater good. That's it. I uh, think, Jennifer, are you going to do the intro for next? Yeah. Are there any questions? Thank you. Yeah, if there's if questions, the we can do questions now okay. and later and also now. Um, <laughs> so many, oh, okay, I'll run around. Or you guys can come up and use this one too. Um, Hi, um, <clears throat> how is Google enforcing the app ads.txt and how might others follow suit? So we are working on um, implementing in our tax stack. Um, as you know, we have a little bit of a complex tax stack in, in all our products, but we're working on it. This gentleman is working on it, uh, among others. So we are going to support it as soon as practically possible, but it takes us a little time given the size of our, uh, our products and, uh, and all the stuff we have to go through and check on. But we are going to support it as soon as practically feasible. And adding to that, uh, so we, uh, uh, both on the buy side and on the sell side, across all of our products, um, when we start enforcing uh, ads.txt back in 2017, we just stopped buying unauthorized full stop uh, and stopped transactioning uh, unauthorized full stop across all of our platforms. And so we'd be doing the same with mobile. Yeah, so we go to level one first, then some of our buy side product will probably go through level two and three uh, as the adoption and enables it and then move to level four when the market is ready for it. Another question? Does Google have any plans to release a report like how many apps on the Google Play Store adopted is how many not, so we can know how adoption is going and that way uh, buyers can plan or prioritize their work? Good question and something we will look into. Uh, we, back in the web days, we did publish some stats on the web adoption, just informal stats. And this is something anyone can crawl from the Google Play Store. Uh, and I think the Tech Lab may also do it. So let's uh, see how we can best get that information out publicly so people can see that. Because it's an important part of trying to drive and, and uh, determine when you want to do what type of enforcement. So good point. With, or, oh, oh, go, with the uh, big screens, TVs, you mentioned Samsung, Roku. Uh, do you guys have any recommendations on how to expedite some of that support um, to encourage those platforms to support developer URLs and then so add platforms can decision off of them? Yeah, so uh, my best recommendation would just be to reach out to these partners and encourage them or ask them uh, uh, what their adoption status is. Uh, we've already been in discussion with uh, a couple of the platforms and uh, who are on board and um, hopefully we'll be announcing sometime in the future. Is, is re so the tech lab as an industry body can't force or and tell them to do, do anything, right? So it's really a market dynamics. The market will hopefully encourage them that it's important and the right thing to do, and then it will happen. So the more everyone can lobby them, the sooner it will happen. 
Well, and given the fact that, especially for video and connected TV, that the ad rates are so valuable there, uh, that, that there, there's a lot of market forces that will push for this natural adoption anyway, um, because video is a primary target for uh, the domain laundering. And so if we, have, uh, if we have a solid solution to stop that type of fraud from uh, being able to happen, I think it's gonna be a natural, uh, natural adoption Another question? It's just to follow the, um, that question. Um, you answered, uh, he asked about the, uh, these OTT devices. My question is, uh, initially you just mentioned that uh, the publisher has to initially has these at, at TXT um, and it will basically go down on the iOS and um, Play Store. So. Can OTD just have that from the uh, parent company? Yes, definitely. Uh, so when we were first working on this spec, we were going to call it uh, mobileads.txt, but then realized, hey, there's actually a, uh, quite a variety of other apps uh, that are distributed through stores that uh, could be uh, utilized for this. So. Uh, uh, so yes, so once an app ads.txt file is published for a given domain, then any um, uh, anything under that umbrella, so let's take Pandora for example. Uh, Pandora is deployed on uh, mobile app, uh, is um, deployed on connected TV, a variety of connected TV devices. Uh, it, once that's published, uh, then any uh, in, any platform that lists that um, Pandora.com as the developer URL uh, uh, that is visible publicly, uh, and, and especially if that app store is participating in the uh, metadata uh, meta tag standard, then uh, that will be covered under uh, under that. And so, yeah, that de definitely would include connected TV. Any other questions? Okay, cool. And then we'll have a kind of a town hall at the end. So if you think of something, write it down. We'll talk about it at the end as well. Thank you, Perrin uh, Curtis. Thank you so much. Just get, just get oh, yeah. Whoops. Ah! Go back. <laughs> okay. Um, and next up, we have Judd. Um, and we're going to keep talking about uh, brand safety and ad fraud. And Judd's going to take us through the next uh, protocol. Judd. Hi there. Uh, I want to give extra thanks to Curtis. Uh, he was talking about appads.txt and support that's implemented by all the various app stores. The Google App Store is the only one that does this right now. He's not going to take credit for it in this presentation, but uh, it's been a tremendous benefit for us. We're a buyer. We uh, rely very heavily on appads.txt. We've actually implemented it at this point and, and are enforcing it. Uh, in the case of Apple, Apple has not supported the standards to this point. We have to get all that App Store data from uh, a third party. We would very much prefer if they implement it in their App Store as well. So thanks again to Curtis. Um, I'm talking today about uh, the next, uh, a next level of transparency in what it is that buyers are buying. In this particular case, we were just talking about ads.txt and it establishes authorization to purchase advertising. So who publishers and app makers have authorized for purchase, or excuse me, for selling of inventory. Uh, what that tells you is a particular ID is, uh, is authorized to sell inventory. It does not tell you who those companies are. So if you look within an ads.txt file, you'll see at exchange, as they de demonstrated, at exchange and ID, but you don't necessarily know who those uh, companies are, who the intermediaries are that are selling this inventory. Supply chain and sellers.json looks to uh, fill that gap by making it so that you understand who it is that you're buying inventory from. Uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not really good at presentations. Uh, I tend to talk into my next slide, and I think I did it again. But there's three main goals. Uh, transparency that I just described, rooting out of potentially fraudulent chains, and I'll go into this in a minute, and uh, also as an input into something known in the industry as SPO, supply path optimization, 
and uh, how it helps to enable building of SPO models. So how does it differ? Again, it tells you who you're buying from. Ads.txt did not tell you that in all cases. In many cases, it could be inferred or uh, via the tag ID that is included in ads.txt. If you had the ability to go and look up a tag ID, you could determine, assuming it was implemented correctly, uh, who the entity was that, rep that was represented by a particular ID. A little bit of a sidebar here. Every single publisher ID in ad tech that I've seen is opaque except for one. That's AdsWiz. AdsWiz actually gives the publisher's name in the publisher ID. Super helpful. Uh, if anybody here is from AdsWiz, thank you very much. Uh, we don't need your sellers.json file, uh, but please produce one anyway. Um, uh, so uh, I think Pear touched on this a little bit in his presentation. What will happen when an ads.txt file is, is uh, it, a, a seller will come to a publisher and say, not only am I selling this directly, but I am reselling my inventory through these in different places. And when those in different places are specified as part of an ads.txt file, this opens up an opportunity for inventory blending or for a bad actor to be inserted into the supply chain. Uh, uh, this, the, the way that this plays out is, let's say that Pandora sells directly to Google. Well, let's not use that example. That, that, that they sell to Purple SSP, using uh, their terminology. Purple SSP in turn says, we will resell our inventory to the following 15 exchanges. And they supply Pandora with the 15 other exchange IDs that should be authorized as resellers for purchase. If reseller number 10 not only gets inventory from purple SSP, but also from bad actor SSP or bad actor exchange, there's an opportunity there for uh, what, what, what's called blending of inventory such that there may be some amount of, uh, of authorized and valid inventory coming from, uh, from purple SSP, but there's also the opportunity for spoofed inventory to come in through bad actor. Uh, supply chain, in, in this particular case, supply chain's goal is to uh, record every single step in the transaction so that it says, this came from Pandora through purple SSP through SSP6, and it was purchased by a particular DSP. Every single request that comes through, you'll be able to follow that particular chain. Um, let me go on to the next one here. So I think I just explained this again, uh, how exactly spoofing gets entered into, uh, in into the supply chain. Let me, Jennifer, I promise I'll get better at this over the next three weeks. Uh, so, uh, supply chain, again, 100% 100 transparent. So currently in an open RTB bid request, you get to see two levels of information. You know which exchange a buyer is buying from. And then you know one level down via uh, an open RTB publisher ID. So if you have the ability to map who all of those publisher IDs are, uh, you can know that you're perhaps buying from Google and Google buys directly from Pandora. Uh, quite often though, when you buy from a reseller, when Google buys from a reseller or Purple SSP buys from a reseller, you don't know beyond that hop when you're buying where the inventory came from. Beyond that one hop, you don't know. Um, Again, supply chain, this is one of the goals there so that you know it went Google, Purple SSP, uh, or Reseller 6, Pandora, or opposite, Reseller 6, Google, Purple SSP, Pandora. Um, and there's two safeguards here. So why couldn't this just be spoofed? Uh, th there's a flag that is whether or not the, the information is complete. This is something that, as a buyer, we're going to be requiring uh, in the near future, such that every single impression that we end up buying will have to have a complete supply chain associated with it. 
And then also, uh, you, you, it allows us to do anomaly management as a buyer. If we're seeing more inventory from one supplier than we see from other suppliers, and we often see inventory from many different suppliers, it gives us a pretty good hint as to where we should go and do a manual investigation. In the future, the hope is, is that the supply chain will also be signed and much less vulnerable to, to spoofing uh, that, that could come up in this particular situation. We're pretty confident that we can battle back any spoofing that happens here, though. Um, sellers.json, uh, again, the, the goal of sellers.json is just to take all of the IDs that you see, and, and I mentioned before that there was uh, uh, purple SSP reseller six. Those are often in, in the supply chain object that is recorded. Those will be seen as IDs. Uh, sellers.json produces a map of, for each one of these IDs, who is the seller, who is the entity behind uh, uh, the reselling of that, of that uh, inventory. Um, in our estimation, there are roughly about 1,500 intermediaries in all of ad tech. Our goal is to produce a whitelist so that we approve which intermediaries that, we're, uh, that we will buy through. And if we see a new intermediary that we've never seen before, it's going to have to go through a vetting process. So having this map of this ID is this company that we trust gives us the ability to say, yes, this is a valid chain that we want to buy from. If we see a new intermediary, we want to be able to approve them before we ever end up buying from them. The ability to uh, quickly create intermediaries that get inserted into the supply chain is uh, a very, very large uh, vector for fraud at this point. Um, uh, shell companies can come and go very, very easily in the supply chain uh, as it is right now. Um, this slide turned out horribly, and I apologize. This is uh, on the top, going from left to right, would be a bid request that you would see that comes from a direct seller. Down below is their sellers.json file that is completely unreadable, and I apologize. Uh, I'll try and make available this slide in some readable form. But essentially it says the first hop is directseller.com. Uh, they are getting inventory on, uh, for the app Words with Friends. They end up reselling it via reseller one. Reseller one ends up reselling it via reseller two. For each of these individual requests, there's a, a mapped sellers.json file that they can look, that, that a buyer can look at to know exactly who it is that they're buying from. Uh, and then tying it all together over here on the right is an ads.txt file that lists directseller.com, reseller1.com, and reseller2.com, uh, and whether they're authorized as a direct seller or reseller of inventory. Uh, those of you who are familiar with OpenRTB, supply chain may look familiar. Uh, there is uh, another implementation that exists called PChain. PChain is... Uh, lacks some of the information that supply chain has uh, and doesn't really have a great path forward for how it is it could, that it could implement everything that supply chain does. Our goal with supply chain was to be a superset of what was implemented in, in PChain and then also to make it more transparent. PChain, the identifiers of the advertising system that represented each hop in the chain was a tag ID. Uh, not everybody has the ability to translate a tag ID into who the entity is behind uh, that tag ID. Uh, supply chain, the way that it's been implemented, uses domain names of the selling system. So instead of some 12-character alphanumeric identifier, what you'll see is purple SSP.com and then an ID. Um, we're not ignoring tag IDs, though. Uh, there's a place for it in sellers.json files so that if you're one of those buyers that wants to make sure that every single intermediary is tag certified, you can still do that. The tag ID would be indicated in their sellers.json file. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Okay, coming to you. 
Um, just wondering what the relationship between this and blockchain would be. Could this just be implemented as a blockchain? Uh, someone said when we were going over this, it might be best not to use the term chain in supply chain. Uh, I disagreed and, and I have to suffer for these questions. No, it, it, it has no relation to blockchain. Uh, uh, I've yet to see a proposal that uses blockchain that could be able to record the amount of information that needs to be recorded uh, impression by impression. Uh, as a buying system, we see nine and a half million requests per second. Uh, I'm at least a little skeptical they can be used for impression level data. The chain that we're trying to ver verify in each uh, bid would would be the same, like the same chain would be reused across multiple bids. There is impression level uh, information stored within the chain as well. There is a bid request ID that can be recorded for every single hop in the chain, and it could not be done statically. Okay, thanks. Um, the question is, I'm from an, I'm from an SSP, so are we looking to halt the transaction in real time, or are we looking to just measure and record everything and then later come back to that? As an SSP? Yeah. Um, it depends on what sort of analysis you want to do. If you're trying to block uh, a request that's coming through you in real time, uh, I, I can tell you our approach. Uh, our approach is to, I mentioned before that we're looking to whitelist every intermediary. Um, that will, uh, any time that we see a new ID for an intermediary, we're probably going to not buy from it initially. We're going to put it into an approval mode. Uh, then once it's approved, th then we open it up for buying. Um, I would expect that, that SSPs could do the exact same thing if you liked. Th does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. I mean, I, I just want to know what we're expected to do about it. Like, are we supposed to stop the transaction, just log it? Do we, what do we? Like, what I are think we? as an SSP or exchange or any intermediary, you can, if you know an, uh, an upstream intermediary is bad, yeah, you could block it, you could stop it. So if you have found that there's a bad actor that you have stopped doing your business with, you can use this as a means to then find traffic from them, even if it comes through someone else. Prime example is that on ADEX, we may, make, we may kick out and bad intermediary, and uh, next day we buy it through some other exchange. So this allows you to identify them and then take action if you think it's appropriate. And what about the entity identification? Like, how do we standardize on that? Like, it feels like the data could be very noisy there. I'm sorry, how do you standardize on what? <clears throat> the identity of the parties involved. Sure. Um, so every hop in the chain, uh, should link, so if you have multi-intermediary bid requests, if I'm buying from purplessp.com and they're buying from reseller6.com, the sellers.json for purplessp.com will have reseller6's ID, the name of the entity, and reseller6.com. So you should see all three of those in a, in a sellers.json file. Then you go to reseller6.com slash sellers.json if they're buying directly from Pandora in the previous example, there will be an ID, it'll say Pandora, pandora.com, direct. Uh, and then there's no expectation of having to follow the chain any further. Again, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out uh, how much vetting happens for the, for the, um, you know, for the larger players, we're all trying to do the right thing. That doesn't, that makes sense to me, right? But for those who are not, I'm trying to think about, you know, the, yeah. the other side of that, which is, you know, I'm going to try to game this somehow or yeah. use the relationships. Let me just jump on my soapbox a little bit. Uh, I, I hope 2018 for, for us was a year of getting ads.txt to full implementation. 2019 is understanding the supply chain. 
I really, really hope that there's some ability in 2020 to name names, to say who are the companies that are doing bad stuff everywhere. And I don't know how to do that yet, but uh, that's what I'd love to see happen. The thing is that before you can start sharing intelligence about bad entities, you have to have a structured, standardized way to identify them. So this is the foundation. With this, we can, if we find legal and policy and other reasons to share, we can do it. Yes, it does, if they are an in, in attack intermediary in there. If the, if the spammers are setting up a shell company to, to pretend to be an ad network, yeah. Now they have to create multiple of those. And uh, there's no guarantee they can't do that, but it raises the bar. It's all about the economics. It raises the cost and makes it harder for them. And if you do an approach like Judd was explaining, that you whitelist a new intermediary and observe them for six months before they can start, well, that slows them down significantly. So it, it increases the ability a lot for us to catch these and potentially share information. I would slightly add on to uh, um, what Judd, uh, what Per has earlier said. So the guidance for ad start text is everyone in the supply chain to enforce it. I think the same guidance would apply to uh, supply chain and uh, seller start JSON. Uh, the earlier you block the bad players, it's better for everyone in the ecosystem. Um, it's like it leads to a lot of saved resources downstream. So uh, one of, in the design discussions around uh, sellers.json, one, uh, one of the discussions was could we have fields that uh, could supply additional uh, information about that business entity? So, for example, uh, one of the proposed fields would be to add uh, like a Dun and Bradstreet number. Uh, yeah, so then that way you could identify the uh, uh, canonical corporate entities behind these actors. Uh, and this is something, for example, um, uh, Apple has for creating developer accounts. You have to supply a Dun and Bradstreet number. So yeah, we've definitely discussed having uh, some sort of um, overarching identity. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So this stuff's all great. Um, I actually do a little seminar for new engineers and employees about everything that's wrong with ad tech, and these pretty much address directly what's happening now. But it's an arms race, right? So this stuff is gonna work short term, but um, I'm certain the bad actors are gonna figure out ways around it. So how are you gonna, you know, and it took years to get to this point. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what, if anything is given to you know, what are the weaknesses in the system that could be exploited? And yeah, I started working on anti-fraud at the trade desk in August of 2017, just as ads.txt was being introduced. I wasn't very involved in ads.txt being designed, but I was very loud in the end, uh, trying to make sure that, that we got it right. And sure enough, ads.txt moved all of the fraud temporarily to in-app. Uh, now, appads.txt is going to squeeze in app, and it's going to go somewhere else. And then we're already seeing this blending take place. Uh, I, I think that the bad actors know that this is coming and uh, know that, that appads.txt is coming, and they're having to hone their skills a little bit to make their inventory a little bit more difficult to, uh, to detect. Um, hopefully, this will help. Ads.cert which will be described, I think is being presented later. That's a huge uh, effort at making that also go away. Um, we don't really know. Uh, I th think that we're gonna be a little better about moving quickly. Th this, these two initiatives were first demonstrated less than two months ago. Uh, it was presented for a small group of people in, in mid to late February. Uh, and I was very heartened by how quickly this got to public comment, which happened last Thursday, and I'm extremely excited to see this go out and see what happens next. 
Uh, getting to a whitelist, I think, is the best. Uh, getting to a whitelist with some level of confidence in the industry that these are all up and up companies is going to slow down the creation of shell companies. Then what will probably start to happen is bad actors will buy existing trusted companies and you got to stay on top of that too. Um, one thing that I found out in the last several months of trying to understand all the intermediaries, a lot of them are the same company. Uh, there are several companies that have multiple names that exist on different exchanges and there's no press release showing one bought the other, they're just the same company. The um, fighting fraud is uh, like most cyber crime, it's a money game. Uh, unless it's sabotage, but in this case it's a money game. And it's all about raising the cost. This significantly raises the cost for them. And yes, we have plenty of job security, lots of more stuff for Jennifer and Judd and others to come up with uh, in the future, but this is significantly changing the game. So I've been doing this for many years and this is very, very promising. Any more questions? This side of the room? Or that side of the room? I was just going to say uh, congratulations to Judd on this, and uh, and it was very impressive to see just how quickly this went from a proposal to um, a fully published specification. So yeah, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thanks, Judd. Um, awesome. So I'll just grab this mic really quick so it's not floating around. Um, cool. So we uh, we've learned a lot already, and. Uh, we're gonna go to a break. Um, please don't leave. I wanna see all of you again. <laughs> um, but I, I think just a note of closing, um, you know, there's a congratulations to Judd, but it really is Judd who wrote the specs, thank you. Um, but also the whole working group who was able to provide feedback, right? Like this, uh, for those of you who, who maybe haven't seen your face in a while, but I hear your voices on the calls, um, you all contribute to these initiatives to be peer reviewed, uh, to go through a set of, um, um, uh, of, of, of checks and ch checks and balances, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, that cycle in the working groups is part of what we're we're all about, and so it's really cool to to see that come to fruition. Um, cool. So we'll do like a ten minute break. Um, the restrooms again are um, out the hallways here. Um, there's a code which is one one two two five, I think. Um, and then uh, just maybe find someone from Pandora to, to go with you, or make sure they prop the door open for you so you don't get locked out. But we'll come check you. Make sure that you don't get locked out. Um, and then there's some, I think there's still some refreshments left. Um, water is in the kitchen area and that's all the important stuff. Um, come back, we'll start again in 10 minutes. So that is, let's just start right at three. That'll be good. And then uh, come, come back because we have a happy hour at the end too. So you gotta stick around. <laughs> Thanks, see you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you too. Well, thank you guys for putting this on. This is fantastic. Oh, cool. cool. I brought a friend with me. This is Tara. Jennifer. Hi, Tara. Hi, Jennifer. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I've read some of your publications. Awesome. I saw your shirt and I was like, oh, oh Yeah. Folks showing up. I got to put on my sweater. Oh, yeah. We recently had her come out from New York, so she's out here on the West Coast now. How hard I died when you left If I yield to my trances Will I get up close again? I had only one thing to do and I... Check, 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 check. Thank you. Hey everyone, let's go ahead and get seated. Whoa, it got quiet, cool. That must mean uh, we're hungry for more ad tech content. <laughs> um, awesome, so I hope everyone had some uh, interesting chats um, during our little break. Um, there's a lot of really cool people here, um, really smart people. Um, and we're gonna uh, keep the conversation uh, flowing uh, and shift pace just a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about open measurement SDK. Um, Alex is going to give us the lowdown on uh, Pandora uh, and the OMSDK.
Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Hello. My name is Alex Shuganov. I'm a mobile engineer uh, on the ads team here at Pandora, and I'm here to talk about measurements. So we're going to start with a quick overview of what measurement is, uh, in case you don't know, which I would have surprised. Then we'll talk about open measurement working group, uh, open measurement SDK, and uh, we'll discuss some best practices which will make adopting measurement less painful for you. And then we'll talk about the future a little bit. All right, so when we talk about measurements, uh, what we really mean is ad quality measurement. And uh, at the bottom of this all, the foundation is the invalid traffic detection. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we all heard enough about fraud today, but can't stress this enough, I guess. Uh, if you're measuring viewability or anything on that list and you can filter invalid traffic, then your measurement is not going to account for much. Uh, the other two items are pretty important, they're viewability and brand safety, and then uh, the rest, uh, uh, it really just depends on the need of your particular placement. Uh, at Pandora, we obviously uh, starting to look into audibility, and then audience verification is a pretty important component too. So how, how do you measure quality uh, of your ad? Well, at this, at this point, uh, Open Measurement Group has done a lot of work and uh, there's Open Measurement SDK available for you. We made proposal to VAST and OpenRTB to uh, account for that uh, availability of Open Measurement SDK. Uh, but the most important thing when you think about ad quality measurement is to uh, accept the fact that you need client-side implementation. So server-side integration will not work. You're just not going to be able to certify and accredit the solution like this. So that, that's pretty important. Um, so once you have your integration ready, uh, uh, OMSDK integration, the next thing you do, you get certified by IAB. There's a standard process of how to do it. You just uh, present them with the sample implementation of your integration and that they issue a certification. And once you have this certification, uh, what the advantage that it gives you is that if you're working with the measurement vendor that is certified, uh, that is accredited by MRC, then this MRC accreditation also extends to your OMSDK integration. So now you're all set. Uh, so it, it seems like it's not completely straightforward. So why the hell would you do that? Uh, well, it turns out that advertisers are actually pretty excited about quality. Uh, it gives them a protection of uh, their investment because they can hold publishers accountable. And they're also ready to invest more money in uh, inventory where the, the quality bar is high. So as a publisher, it's your chance to make more money. Uh, and overall in the infrastructure will reduce waste. So in, in a way, it's like the industry is going green. Um, so Open Measurement Working Group, uh, group was formed to uh, address a problem uh, that was particularly obvious in the mobile space. And what it was is uh, uh, we, st we started thinking about how to measure quality in a mobile app. And there are a lot of measurement vendors out there trying to do that. And e every single one c came with a solution that required a native SDK. And as a publisher uh, or as an integrator of that solution, you realize that all of a sudden you have five SDKs that you need to integrate and that just doesn't scale. Uh, so the industry came together, uh, measurement vendors, IAB of course, uh, ad platforms, publishers, and um, they talked about how can we turn this into a single SDK for in-app at least, and uh, how can we come up with a single API that all measurement vendors can use. And uh, that API will provide access to uh, ad verification signals that the SDK will surface. And then the publisher also is in, in control over uh, how to load, uh, over loading of verification resources that it gets from measurement vendors. Uh, and it also has control over ad measurement session, which, which is also great because that if you as a publisher is in control, it's your chance to reduce discrepancies. And then uh, the group obviously also uh, makes an effort to drive uh, adoption of that SDK and uh, innovation of measurement standards. And uh, Pandora is a company we've been uh, 
pretty much since the inception of Open Measurement Group uh, as a direct contributor. So we've contributed a lot of our time to discussions in the group and to SDK itself. All right, so uh, what does SDK allow you to do today? Uh, for, first of all, it's been available for a year. Believe it or not, we just had our one year anniversary a couple of days ago. Uh, it supports Android and iOS. Uh, so it's in-app only at this point. Uh, display and video in inventory supports fully. It, you can do HTML or native measurement sessions. And uh, in terms of capability, the, usually when people talk about open measurement SDK, they think of viewability. Well, the SDK itself doesn't really measure viewability. What it does, it uh, identifies all the necessary signals uh, that you could use to implement ad verifications such as viewability and there are a lot of viewability standards so uh, it's it's really not the responsibility of the sdk to measure viewability itself the, its responsibility is to provide enough signals so that the implementation of a viewability standard is possible and that that usually happens somewhere on the server side after um, a lot of proprietary logic has taken place uh, yeah, so some of the things that SDK provides are obviously the, the view hierarchy inspection, uh, geometry events, which are things important for viewability, uh, application lifecycle, the background of location, foreground, and uh, other events, uh, volume changes, media playback events. Uh, this is on par with VAST. If, you're, if, if you have implement, VAST implementation uh, in your client, then it, it's relatively straightforward to extend that integration to open measurement SDK if you're thinking about video. Um, publisher controlled ad session lifecycle. Again, I, I mentioned that this is important that the publisher is in charge. So things like impression event, uh, playback start, uh, all this, um, the clicks, all, all these signals that were previously sort of a black box and uh, a relied on the implementation that was done by measurement vendor and could be the source of discrepancies. Now they're completely open uh, to the publisher. So that means potentially less discrepancies if you do it right. Uh, and then uh, obviously essential placement metadata that will identify OS, device, application, bundle ID, and the pass surface all the signals to the measurement vendor. All right, so now uh, let's take a quick look at the architecture of the SDK. Uh, there, there are native components uh, and JavaScript components. Uh, you need to run JavaScript. That's the, something we couldn't get away with. Uh, measurement vendors wanted to run their code in runtime. So um, at the heart of the SDK is OmniJS service. This is the JavaScript library that Distribu this is di distributed by IAB and uh, is available to all publishers. So that's this, the heart of the SDK. Then there is uh, the native API that the publisher integration can use to enable OMSDK uh, on that particular ad impression. If your placement depends on WebView for rendering, you, ha you also have an ability to use a JavaScript session API to do ad additional control uh, over the measurement session in JavaScript. So th if you're doing something like a web view, uh, if, if your video player requires a web view, that's the API that you'll have to use in addition to native API. And then what's left here is the interface for the measurement vendor. So measurement vendor, uh, it, it, there, there could be multiple measurement scripts that uh, are provided to you uh, to do ad verification on that particular ad impression. So uh, a me measurement script will use a verification client API and that will allow it to inter interact with OmniJS service. And then once you have all this API, it's, it's really just about exchanging signals. So signals start flowing and everyone is happy. And uh, I, I've been referring to the API as OMIT. So it stands for Open Measurement Interface Definition. It's uh, similar to MRATE in terms of naming conventions. Um, all right, so what about ad verification resources? So when, when you receive your ad response, uh, there could be ad verifications uh, in that response. And what it means basically is uh, that there are JavaScript that you need to execute in runtime uh, at the time that impression is registered. And uh, there could be multiple representations of how, how this is av uh, available to you. 
Uh, the simplest form is, uh, is just a URL uh, to uh, the measurement script that already includes parameters. Uh, that, that's what we usually see in HTML creatives. Uh, the, it's very simple, but just a JavaScript. Now in the native formats, uh, you will see that sometimes it's just a, a single JavaScript resource URL, uh, which is again one item, but in most cases, uh, you will see three parameters. It's a JavaScript resource URL, which is a URL to the measurement script, which may or may not include parameters. But then there is a vendor key, which uniquely identifies the measurement vendor, and then verification parameters uh, string, which is in most cases uh, just another way to pass parameters to the script, just as you would do with a query string in the uh, in the environment where DOM is available, like uh, HTML and uh, WebView. Uh, in, in this case, there is a, uh, sometimes there's a need to pass verification parameters separately. Uh, and that's what you would see in VAST. So uh, uh, Open Measurement Group submitted a uh, proposal uh, that was accepted in VAST 4.1. It was a, a few changes to add verifications node, which was already available in VAST 4. It was just not flexible enough uh, to uh, use it for uh, open measurement right away. So what was added is uh, the vendor attribute uh, on the verification node, which, which is required and uniquely identifies the company. Then uh, the JavaScript resource that is supposed to, uh, to be used with open measurement SDK should have API framework OMIT. And then uh, if verification parameters uh, need, need to be passed, then uh, there is a, a verification parameters node where an arbitrary string of parameters can be specified. And then since uh, VAST4 already introduced add verifications node, but it, it, it wasn't exactly good enough uh, to work with OMSDK out of the box, it, it was decided that uh, the solution for VAST4 and below will be to use extensions. And um, the, the format in the extension is the same uh, as uh, VAST4.1. Add verifications node that contains uh, verification resources can occur uh, in the wrapper tag or in inline creative. Uh, and uh, if you're talking about wrapper, then any uh, hop in the, um, uh, in the vast uh, redirect chain can include its own verification resources. Now, when you're making a request, uh, you can declare support for uh, open measurement SDK in that request, and that will allow uh, anyone upstream to uh, take certain actions, like uh, actually include this ad verification resources that, that uh, will work with open measurement SDK, or, or take some additional considerations that uh, will ensure that uh, measurements are properly happening uh, upstream. So, uh, you start by passing the API value of uh, seven, which is uh, a part of AdCom specification at this point. The seven means that it's Omit API version one. Uh, and then you also need to pass Omit partner name and Omit partner version. Uh, the partner name is the unique identifier that gets assigned to you by IAB once you get certified. And the partner version is the current version of your SDK or application. So these are uh, the two strings that, that you need to pass in your ad request or the bid request. And uh, there are changes in, in VAST and uh, OpenRTB uh, to, to account of that. Uh, uh, two macros in VAST 4.1 uh, that uh, allow you to pass the uh, framework and uh, omit partner name. And then in OpenRTB, you, again, you have API value seven that you can pass in the bid request. And then uh, it, it's not on this slide, but in the source, uh, in the extension of the source uh, of the uh, OpenRTB bid, bid request, you can also pass uh, the partner, uh, partner name and partner version. Right, so now that we covered that, let's, let's look at the entire flow one more time. So this, this is a web view integration. You start with a mobile client that have a, a, an ad placement that requires web view for rendering. So you make an ad request. And then when a request comes back, uh, if you want uh, open measurement uh, SDK to work properly in this web view, the first thing you, you need to do so you, need to, you need to make sure 
that OmniJS service, that heart of the SDK, is injected in the web view before the creative is loaded there. And there are multiple ways to handle this. So you can change uh, your HTML creative on, on the ad server to uh, include that additional JavaScript, or the client can handle that. And then uh, once the creative actually received, and if there is a measurement script, then it will happily communicate with OmniJS service, and that, that will allow, uh, this is an important part, this will allow a verification script to know that this is an environment where open measurement SDK is supported so that it's not trying to measure viewability through some kind of alternative method like Emirate or uh, just by listening to uh, JavaScript events and uh, de determine when the creative is loaded. Uh, so at, at this point, you're in control. The, crea the creative knows, um, sorry, the measurement script knows that this is the environment where Omnit is supported and it will wait for your instructions. So you can, you, again, you can do it from uh, the web view itself or you can do it natively and you will instruct uh, op Open Measurement SDK uh, to initiate the session and then fire impression event. Uh, similar integration uh, uh, for the native views. If uh, you have a placement that requires a native media player or a native image view, again, you make, make a request to the server the request comes back, there could be ad verification resources in it. So in this case, you don't have a web view, what do you do? Well, OMSDK covers that. It provides uh, internal uh, JavaScript environment uh, to execute this ad verification resources. So you simply use uh, the native AP OMSDK API to uh, start uh, a session where this ad verification resources are passed to the SDK. Uh, and again, the JavaScript environment that this provided by OMSDK includes that OmnJS service. So it's, it's already there. And once the script is injected, it's happily starts communicating with the SDK and kind of waits, waits for commands and uh, signals. And then you initiate the measurement session and fire the impression and all the other playback events if you have a media player here. So again, you're, as a publisher, you're in control here. So now that we covered all of that, let's talk about some of the best practices here. Now, uh, w usually when you start measuring something, I even if it's another way of uh, uh, registering impression, usually what it means to you is, is discrepancies. It's a D word. So I, I, my advice to you, if, if you're a publisher or um, if, if you're an integrator, if you're, if you're an ad platform providing SDK, really study every re guideline, every recommendation that IAB or MRC uh, released about impressions or viewable impressions. Uh, so uh, you, you'll see things like begin to render. Like, what, what does it mean? MRC is notorious for releasing something that doesn't actually make any sense. It's a, <laughs> it's a guidelines, but uh, how do you implement it? So uh, it's, at this point, it's, it's actually up to you uh, because the, the impression event uh, is in your control. So just do your best to figure out what begin to render is for your placement. Um, and uh, op Open Measurement Group will continue working uh, with MRC and we'll definitely release guidelines that clarify what begin to render actually is for display, what it, what it means for native display, what it means for video, native video, and all, all these things. Um, so at, at that point, you'll, you'll have a better classification of impressions, but at this point, it's just one impression event and you should use it as a common denominator uh, that is a benchmark and you, ca you can use to see uh, what is what is different in the in the ecosystem? Is am I firing ad server impression trackers too early, or am I allowing third party impression trackers to fire at some other point, or is my OMSDK impression not aligned with this? So, to give you an idea, uh, MRC and MRC's interpretation of begin to render for video is a playback start. So it's, it's not the, the point where you created the player and you displayed the player, the empty player view to the user. It's when you started the playback. So that, that's, 
this is a good point for the common denominator. The playback started, that's your impression. So fire the ad server impression, fire the third party tracker impressions, fire OM SDK impression at that point. And then you can start your investigations, like who is falling behind and why. Once you do that, and if viewability is important, you can optimize for viewability by doing prefetching or even pre-rendering. So that, that will minimize the risks that you're wasting opportunities on impressions that are not going to be viewable anyway. So, uh, so some problems with HTML5 creatives, uh, basically you can't pre-render them. The agencies just don't allow you to do anything other than fire an impression at the time the creative was fully rendered and that just defeats the purpose of pre-rendering. So our hope is that we'll convince, uh, once we have better classification of impressions for open version SDK, we can take this uh, to every ad platform out there, every agency. And it's not going to be just measurement vendor use case. You will be able to use it as the source of truth for impression. Uh, another thing that you should do is implement a kill switch. So uh, this is important because when you get your IAV certification, uh, all your application or SDK versions are certified. Same with revocation of certification. If there's a problem, your certification will be revoked for everything unless you can prove that, oh, this particular app version that I have uh, is no longer using OM SDK because we use the kill switch. So kill switch is useful to uh, reduce the bur burden for you to uh, maintain your certification in case there's a problem uh, that is that can be isolated to a particular app version. Uh, and then the last thing on the list that will just help you get comfortable with how the whole thing works is uh, just write your own measurement script. Uh, OMIT API is very simple. It's just uh, the, the script can literally be 20 lines of code where uh, you will get access to all events. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to see what was happening uh, in your integration and then compare how, how, uh, see how it compares to uh, other measurement vendors. All right, uh, a few words about the future of, uh, of measurement SDK. So uh, obviously we've been out for a year and the uh, number of certified placements out there is actually pretty small, but it keeps growing. So that's, uh, that's the plan, grow the adoption. Then uh, the next release is OMSDK 1.3, which is uh, the, the first interesting release after the 1.0. <laughs> so what that includes, like, like I said, there will be a better classification of ad impressions. You'll be able uh, to describe what kind of impression uh, you are firing on the, on the client side. Is, is that a viewable impression? Is that begin to render impression? Is it two second viewable impression or some, something else? So just uh, a, a little bit more out there so that we can help with discrepancies and also let uh, people optimize for that billable event uh, that, that they use and uh, uh, measurement of audio ads. This is something that Pandora is excited about. So we're driving that effort. Uh, better classification of ad session types. Uh, obviously once the whole thing started working and the data started flowing through the pipes, uh, discovered some problems that uh, maybe it's going to be difficult to accredit some of, to, to get accreditation for some of these things. So. Uh, some cleanup work to keep MRC happy and um, keep measurement vendors happy uh, with a be better classification of what kind of capabilities integration actually uses. And then uh, longer term, we can see evolution of measurement standards. Uh, for example, what is viewability for rewarded ads or uh, some uh, other me measurement standard? There are, there are already a lot of measurement standards for viewability. So we can expect more depending on the use case. And then OMSDK for web video is a big one. The, the team is wor working on that. Uh, ad blocking and uh, deprecation of VPAID. So now that we have Omnit API available, the, the one of the complaints from advertisers was that they can't use a single vast creative uh, to measure viewability. And uh, usually viewability also comes with blocking. 
So that's a blocking is not a, the capability that open measurement SDK currently provides. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, on uh, web, they usually want V paid. And uh, just because, because OM SDK is not available there. So OM SDK on web becomes available, then the blocking capability is added. And at that point, we can talk about removing v as a mechanism for measurement. And then eventually Omid on other platforms, like I said, it's important to implement all these things on a client side, unless, uh, unless it's a web client. So uh, there could be some OTT devices that uh, implement Omid API eventually. Yeah, so here's some recap. We talked about what measurement is, discussed uh, MSDK and its capabilities. It's available on mobile only, but web support is coming eventually. Uh, any measurement vendor can use this SDK to measure uh, viewability, to use it to do basic uh, fraud filtering for GIVT at least, uh, and uh, do some basic brand safety reporting. Like I said, there's no blocking, but at least you can do reporting. Uh, and then VAST and open RTB standards have been amended to include support for open measurement SDK. Uh, I encourage you to uh, go to IAB Tech Lab website, uh, read about open measurement SDK. There are a lot of resources there that will help you get started with the integration and certification. There's onboarding guide. There is a webinar that uh, we did last year when we just released the SDK, there are additional guidelines, guidelines for OpenRTB and all the other things. So that's all. Thank you. Are there any, uh, are there any questions in the room? Yeah, there's no way there's not questions. You covered a lot. That was awesome. Thanks for that rundown. That was really helpful. Um, curious if you see players using this in a connected TV device atmosphere or environment. Is it possible? Or are people, like players, jumping on it? Or are you working with Roku? <laughs> well, it, it's really up to Roku. If Roku wants to work with us, uh, we can talk about how to accommodate them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're at least considering it. But like I said, it's important to do this implementation on the client side, to forget about server side. This is, we can talk about it, but MRC will likely block all efforts to accredit that use case. Uh, so you, you need a full featured client and uh, the Rocco uh, would be the company responsible for providing SDK implementation and then IAB would need to certify that and then management vendors will, would need to sign off. So it, it's just, just like we did with iOS and Android, you could add Rocco to it. Uh, once you have web, uh, that will likely enable a lot of OTTs out there that are actually web clients. And then you have things like Android TV, Apple TV, that could easily gain support just because the code base is almost the same. Other questions? Okay, um, Alex, thank you so much. Thank you. And then our next speaker is a dear friend, Alan. He is uh, stuck on a plane that is uh, fine, but uh, not here. <laughs> um, <laughs> should we, should we con conference him in from plane Wi-Fi? That would be terrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he, uh, he was going to speak to us about ADCOM and how he got to ADCOM and why it matters. Um, uh, but I think maybe it would be fun to learn uh, who knows ADCOM. Like who, who would say, oh, I've heard of that. I'm familiar with ADCOM. <laughs> Raise your hands. Wait, okay, cool. Okay, okay, so cool. We have a lot to learn. Um, and then how many people would uh, say, I'm, I'm familiar with OpenRTV like, or have implemented it? Okay, cool. So hopefully in a year, those are the same hands that are 
uh, raised for um, AdCom as well. Um, and uh, instead of our dear friend Alan from SpotX, um, we're going to have Kurt Larson from ShareThrough um, speak to uh, open media and AdCom as well. And Kurt, thank you. Thanks. You know, I would just submit that the fact that some of Alan's colleagues flew here from Colorado and are here in time, and the fact that he prepared no slides for this as evidence that he actually intended to only come for the happy hour. <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously I didn't prepare for this, but I want to talk a little bit about what AdCom is. Um, if you look at sort of the past and really the present world of our specs, there are at least half a dozen specs that talk about creatives in some way. Um, OpenRTB has obviously talked about creatives. OpenDirect, which is the way we do orders based non real time ads, talks about creatives. There are a bunch of varied creative approval standards today that talk about creatives. There's VAST, there's also the native standard, uh, which has been separate from RTB. All of those specs talk about creatives, and most of them uh, talk about creatives from two perspectives. One is describing the opportunity to render an ad or a creative, and two is then responding and describing, here is the ad or creative to render. And so what we try to do in looking at sort of the 3.0 suite of specs is figure out how can we unify the way we talk about creatives across all of the specs and always talk about creatives in the same way. Um, and when we talk about RTB 3.0, there is a specific RTB standard that's part of the suite of 3.0 specs. But we also sometimes use the word RTB 3.0 to actually refer to the suite of specs. So maybe that's a little bit confusing. Um, there is a great graphic for that that I would have put on my slides uh, if I had slides um, that kind of describes how these creatives relate to each other. Um, so AdCom is a part of the 3.0 suite of specs. And what AdCom specifically does is describes the opportunity for a creative. So things like what is the size of the placement? Um, does it support MRAID? Does it support the o OMSDK that we just heard about? Like what are the different things that this um, opportunity supports? And then on the, on the uh, other side, it describes what the creative is, right? This is, a, this is a banner ad of 300 by 250. This is a native ad. This is an audio ad. Um, so it, it simply describes those things. And it's used by at least three specs that are part of the 3.0 suite. So RTB, which is still how we talk about real-time bidding. Open Direct, which is still how we talk about order-based bidding. There is now a new creative approval API um, that we're not talking about today. But we've now standardized a way of doing creative approval and that also references AdCom. Um, what, we've, what we've also done in AdCom is bring in the native spec. So there's no longer a separate native spec. Um, native is now part of the core spec. And in fact, it's actually part of display. Um, because I think as native has evolved, it's just become like the modern format for display. Um, so native is actually one of the types of display in AdCom, along with traditional banner as well as a new um, sort of simplified, more secure, safe way of talking about banners. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of the overview of what AdCom does. It largely borrows from what was in um, RTB 2.5, as well as what was in the native spec. So it's not like completely revolutionary. Um, and there is a way that you can map the 2.5 um, and the native specs into the new AdCom and into the new RTB 3.0. Um, so it's, it's kind of a part of, of 3.0, but we've pulled it out separately, which also now allows us to iterate on it separately, right? So as we have new types of creative and new things that we want to do in AdCom, it's a completely separate spec. And we, we started it at 1.0, right? Or is it 3.0? Yeah. yeah. So technically, AdCom is 1.0. So like there can be an AdCom 1.1 that you're transacting with RTB 3.0. So, and, and that is probably the idea. It's unlikely that RTB, which is simply how you buy and sell something, talking about prices and PMPs and things, is going to need to evolve as quickly as AdCom, which is talking about creatives that tend to change more quickly. But in any case, we can now move the versions forward of both of those things separately. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my impromptu talk on that. Any uh, questions about AdCom or 3.0? Uh, Lots of questions. I'm going to go to Ash first. Sorry, Pear. Ash, OK. Um, is there a possibility to uh, push AdCom into OpenRTB 2.5? Any aspects of AdCom? Have you guys considered it? Uh, it, it would be tough. I, I can't think how that would work. Because the, the thing that, if you look at RTB 2.5 and prior versions, the concepts of the ad and the concepts of the transaction are very intermingled. 
So we had to go through object by object in 2.5 and say, okay, these fields, I mean, some objects were clear cut, but many objects were mixed and say, these fields are actually about the transaction. These fields are about the creative. Um, so sure, you could tack on adcom into an extension object to 2.5, but it would then be duplicative with other fields elsewhere in 2.5. Um, so yeah, I don't think that would work very well. Unless there's a specific use case you had in mind, but. Is there a future where adcom replaced vast as an ad response format? Yeah, I'm sure Alan would love to talk about that. Um, that I believe that that is on, we're not talking about that today, right? No, we can. Yeah, okay. that, that is on the, I, I'm not super active in that group. That I believe that is on the video roadmap is to get video out of this separate sort of third party serve vast spec and actually bring it into adcom itself and actually describe the video in line in the response. Um, that's not been done yet. That was just deemed as like too large of a task. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a more comment on that because it's not really my expertise area, but I think that is the idea. Does the adcom deal with the question of transparency from the buy side in terms of knowing who the advertiser is and, and the chain, so to speak, the, the buy, buy chain instead of the supply chain and all of that good stuff? Um, I think the short answer is, is no. Um, there's, there's not really anything new in adcom. I think we did add some sort of fields around like the identity of the agency. There's a couple new IDs that represent like the agency. I, I can't remember quite what the ideas we ended up adding were, um, but I wouldn't say we made like any monumental steps in that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, for, for somebody who's not super involved in Adcom, uh, I have a question about I think Adcom is something between SSP and uh, buyers behind the scenes. Are there anything that are guidelines or something that's between a publisher and it, like in the ad request is mostly a HTTP with payloads and stuff. How does how do we see transformation from that into Adcom that is consistent across ad servers? Is there is there any thought process around that or background? So is your, is your question sort of does Adcom somehow need to affect something down to the publisher level or is it really constrained starting at the like yeah yeah. yeah yeah so it, at pandora we we have this uh concept of ad requests that's made to a mediation engine and then behind the scenes are all of these things and as we implement uh omsdk and other stuff we are figuring out how do we pass these capabilities in that parameter that will translate to the right adcom i think we're looking at apis from google to see what's the new API parameter to pass? Uh, so I'm, I'm asking this question because Adcom is addressing only a certain ecosystem and not end-to-end. -end. And so it goes to the same question as what Alex was asking, is Adcom gonna replace VAST where it becomes a payload of choice for a complete end-to-end -end from, a, from a publisher or client endpoint all the way in. And it's also the ad request. It's, it's like all the complex parameters we have to pass across is adcom being considered as the common data model for like end to end. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is the idea. If you think about the sort of canonical example that's at least in my head of the ad ecosystem of a publisher working with an SSP slash exchange that's a web publisher who's then doing an RTB request to a DSP. In that use case, I don't think the publisher has anything to do with adcom or rtb at all like they don't usually deal with that world but if you think about different worlds um, especially as you get more into open direct and into um, uh, different types of, of uh, direct selling and, and sdks uh, in that case maybe the publisher is more involved in constructing the request um, and the publisher could certainly be constructing that request in adcom format uh, and there's two halves of adcom there's the we don't like to use these words, request and response, because they kind of connote RTB, but like the description and the, the ad um, the ad itself. Um, so the publisher could easily construct the description half of the adcom object and, and send it along to whatever platform they're working with. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay. Um, Kurt, could you also help us understand? Uh, whoa, there's a weird echo right here. Okay. Um, could you also help us understand what um, ad cert is? Yeah, so um, another thing I was not prepared to speak to, but we realized that um, uh, Patrick from, from, from Share Through, my colleague, is going to talk about our experiences implementing signed bid requests. And we just realized we weren't actually describing what a signed bid request is and what it's for. Um, so there's another new spec that's actually just in beta right now. It's not even like fully launched that's called ads.cert or signed bid request. And it extends on a lot of the security concepts we've been talking about today. Um, we've been talking a lot about like the supply chain. So to extend the Rolex you know, analogy, we've been talking about like what are the hands that this Rolex passed through? Where did it go? Where did it come from? What different warehouses did it go to? Um, who manufactured it? But we haven't actually dealt with the Rolex itself. We haven't looked at, is this actually a Rolex? All we've worried about is where did it come from? Right? And we know that if it came from a fairly trusted path, it's more likely to be a Rolex. And if it came from an untrusted complex pass, path, it's less likely to be a Rolex. But we don't know definitively if it is or not. And what signed bid request seeks to do is provide a cryptographic proof that this is actually the Rolex, right? Or that this is actually the bid request that's being described. Um, so signed bid request is a way for the originator of an impression request, and this is mostly contemplated for an RTB context, right? The originator of an impression request to cryptographically sign the impression request and sign certain aspects of that impression request. And that signature is then passed through the entire chain of custody unmodified, and anyone in that chain of custody, any intermediary or certainly the buyer, can then, uh, can then validate that signature and determine, yes, this is the uh, impression request being described, or the, yes, this is a Rolex. Um, and we can't determine everything. Um, we started with what is really a quite simple solution. Um, again, I don't have slides to, or anything to talk about some of the limitations here, but um, we are basically assigning a few key values that we know should not change throughout the supply chain. Um, so things like the domain, the bundle ID, the IDFA or IP address, the consent string. We haven't talked about consent string fraud, but that's happening out there. Those kinds of things are signed at the origin and are passed all the way through. So those things are now immutable and you can inspect that they actually have not been changed anywhere in the supply chain. Other things, unfortunately, we haven't figured out an easy way to sign, like say um, the size of the banner or something like that. Um, but some of those key fields, we have figured out how to sign um, and so the, the originator, which would typically in actual implementation end up being the header bidder wrapper or the ad server, um, the originator of the request can generate that signature and then anyone in the supply chain can inspect it. Um, so uh, a number of us, th this is like a pretty new concept. So a number of us in the industry said, let's kind of try this. Let's try running this and see, see if it actually works, see what the um, cost is of doing it in terms of computing cycles and the complexity of implementing it and the reliability of validating the string. Um, so several different people did that actually. Um, Patrick at Shethra is going to talk about our experience doing it. Um, Rakuten did it. I think, Judge, you guys did it at Trade Desk, right? A few of us um, tried this just to validate that it works and it did. Um, and so it's, it's currently in beta and we'd like some more people to try it and start getting this um, implemented into the wild. Um, so maybe I'll hold any questions until after um, Patrick's going to talk about our experience um, at Share Through generating the signed bid request, and then uh, maybe he and I can both answer any questions after that. Maybe maybe just a quick moment. Uh, does everyone understand what ad cert is, or are there questions about that? Okay, we can also address them after Patrick. Thank you so much, Kurt. Okay. Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, for giving that introduction. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a developer story, uh, talking about our experience of going through and uh, implementing a POC, something that we could uh, sign bid requests, get it down to partners, make sure that those can be verified. Uh, so one of the big questions that we had was, how can we have a footprint that is not going to be too expensive? There was a question earlier about blockchain. And one of the drawbacks to that is that in order for that to work, it has to be very expensive to add an entry to the ledger. Uh, and we didn't want to make it cost prohibitive to uh, you know, sign every impression in a unique way. 
uh, and we do have to make that unique. So uh, every bid request will include something like a transaction ID or a timestamp or both, ideally. Uh, so then that way, there's no way that they can be cached. Uh, this is using uh, public key cryptography. So one of the uh, keys behind that is um, almost all the information is public except for the private key, and that private key is only going to be known by the signer, and that will identify the, uh, or prove the identity of that signer. So some more questions. Uh, we knew that we wanted to do elliptic curve. Uh, as the basis for our certificates. Uh, those can provide uh, stronger cryptography at higher speeds, uh, more entropy for the same uh, size of key. That was at least in our implementation. For any of these certificates, uh, the details are gonna be inside the certificate itself, so you can, uh, you know, ultimately it's up to your implementation to figure out what you want to have. Uh, we're a scholar shop, so we generated our uh, signatures with Bounds of Council, which is JVM library, uh, but the keys we generated through OpenSSL just started to get additional verification and everything that we did. Uh, took all of the curves that were defined in both, which ended up being uh, 55, uh, ran some warm-up uh, iterations, uh, and then through uh, 10,000 test iterations, you know, figured out what our performance was. So this is way too much detail. Uh, but you can see that there's definitely some curves here which are clear losers, uh, you know, much slower than everyone else. Uh, and so we went through a few iterations of this, tried to identify ones that you know, we could work with them if we wanted, really wanted to, but it would be additional burden on implementers uh, and especially verifiers if we wanted to go with that. Uh, eventually pared this down, filtered out those bad performers, I uh, only considered the recommendations from uh, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. Uh, and here we have what we chose as our clear winner, which is the prime 256 V1 uh, curve. Uh, consistent, uh, fast, sub uh, millisecond encryption times. So get that out, push it out to production, had to deal with some restrictions in Bouncy Castle. Uh, specifically, it's a signed library uh, and didn't work well, very well with our uh, deployment model. Once we got past that, though, uh, we were able to get something running in production three months and could have uh, done some A-B comparisons here, but there's basically no overhead at all. Uh, it was basically the same as noise. Uh, so some things that we didn't cover as part of the POC, but we did identify. Uh, so cert certificates don't last forever. Uh, you set up your you know, HTTPS, your SSL, that typically lasts for a year. You know, it would be about that same, perhaps a little bit faster for this, depending on what your needs are. Uh, so we'd have to specify a place where you can find that certificate, and that's gonna be part of the signature itself. Uh, so rather than just being a single ads.cert file, you'll probably be hosting multiple. So then that way there can be a failover uh, as you switch to a new certificate. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, a lot of the field, or all the fields are gonna to have to be defined on the originator. Uh, so that does have some interesting interplays with things like GDPR, where if you're doing any kind of anonymization, uh, that anonymization would have to happen uh, at the point of signing. So if you're going to truncate an IP or uh, anonymize a user agent, that would have to happen at the point that you are generating the signature, because uh, if it happens later on, that's going to change the thing that you're signing. Uh, and. Uh, Uh, and I th think that's what I have. Any uh, questions? Thank you. Questions? So, Kurt, I think you mentioned that you couldn't sign the ad format, the ad size. Is there any specific reason why that's difficult? Um, 
unfortunately, it's just there's just no simple way to come up with. So what you have to do to make the signature is have a text string that you can easily generate as the input into the signature algorithm. And it's uh, very definable and easy for both the signer and the inspector to generate in the same fashion. And the way that the ad size is described in our adcom or in RTB structure is just not very amenable to that. Um, what we did do is construct a very simple idea that you, you have a little, um, a small string in there that consists of the letters V, A, and D for whether this was a video, audio, or display request. And you can have more than one of those letters in there. So you can't, we can at least try to get rid of the banner to video format fraud. Um, but it was really just a very simple issue of like, it's hard to just very simply define that size um, in a string. Uh, so yeah, I, I helped participate in uh, authoring this uh, specification. And one of the areas I thought I'd comment on is um, looking at this from a computer security problem. Uh, it's a, it's a, actually a pretty tough computer security problem because we're doing broadcast signing and uh, it, it, so you have to be able to uh, generate in real time a signature that would be validatable by anyone uh, participating as a listener uh, to, these, uh, uh, to, to these bid requests that are being sent out. So uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the points that we tried to make in the specification, um, uh, beta specification, is that uh, the, the, the messages, you can verify that they are originating from, um, a, uh, from a valid source, but you don't necessarily uh, have a verification that those um, impressions are actually going to be delivered uh, to that same original publisher. So uh, we still do have some work here to uh, 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 complement this, uh, uh, to complement the standard with uh, some sort of appropriate um, impression uh, verification, uh, cryptographic verification step on the impressions. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Um, is it possible to cache the uh, hashed entities? Can you take an encryption and save it for later? It has to be in real time. That's the reason why the uh, message uh, that's being signed has a transaction ID and a timestamp uh, that should make it completely unique. And so if you try to catch it, it's not going to match up with the rest of the bid request. Thank you. Although, not your question, I do think it, it's most likely that buy side platforms will do the inspection of the signatures probably offline uh, rather than putting them uh, in sequence in their bid response, although it's up to the, it's up to the, the bidder. Do all <clears throat> Transaction. Sorry. Can you have the transaction ID separated from the entities? Meaning, I can see how you would want to generate it in real time a transaction ID, but the entities, they are who they are, right? And so you could maybe save those for later, not have to re-encrypt them every single time. So it, I'm trying to optimize here, basically. No, no. So the signature has to happen by who owns that private key, which would have to be the originator. Uh, so. This is mostly defeating uh, intermediaries that are trying to replay those requests. If you have an originator who tries to send the, out the exact same bid request, and if they're the ones who's doing the signing, yeah, the signed bid request is saying that I'm the one who's sending this bid request, and we can verify that. But if you're signing it and you're sending that same bid request to multiple pl uh, places, that's not going to uh, be detectable. Some more questions. So, so in that case, should we also make a standard right? Like the way we pass constant string throughout the chain, like all the third party pixels, same way should we also kind of pass the, the yes. signed signature, digital signature DS throughout the entire chain? Yes. So the signature will uh, be generated at the originator and will have to go down the, the entire chain so that every step along the chain you can verify that this bid request originated from this uh, person and that you can verify that there's no modifications along the way. Yeah, it should just follow along the whole process, just like the IP address and the domain name and everything else it, it follows along. Right. 
It's just another field. It's, a, it's just a text field. Uh, the, one of the problem is if you see many times the actual IP when the impression happens or click happens, even a refer, they get changed. The reason is maybe there's a proxy involved, and so the bid request IP and the impression IP don't match. Same with the domains, the refer don't match with the domain, and that's where it gets challenging because when you try to compare your numbers with DCM number, IS number, Dell Verify numbers, they don't match because obviously they are deduplicating, devaluating, or valuing all those KPIs based on what they get from the actual impression on click pixel. And other side, when we are bidding, we are relying on the information which comes in bid request. And there's always a mismatch. How do we solve that problem? So you're talking about, for example, the IP address mismatching between the bid request versus what the impression pixel then records. Yeah, this doesn't address that because this really stops at the point that the, the bidder has responded with a bid um, based on a validated cryptographically signed IP address. But then if it's changed uh, when the impression pixel fires, it's not really addressing that. But Harry, I think, I think that's a different problem. Yeah, there's a different problem. Uh, that's true. But just like all these things we're talking about, it solves one of the specific problems, but not every problem, right? Yeah, no progress. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, by the way, just to tie a loop on, I think Curtis or Pear referred to this earlier um, when they were talking about app ads, because uh, the fundamental problem we were dealing with with implementing app ads was just how do you go from a, um, an app bid request where you have a bundle ID and a store ID to be able to retrieve some file in a dependable way. Um, and so we solved that with app ads txt through that whole mechanism that Perrin Curtis talked about, um, and, and you guys referenced this. But that same mechanism is what will be needed for ads.cert to work for in-app. So we've actually solved both those problems, right? Because to inspect the signature, you need to be able to go get the publisher's public key. And to get their public key, you need to be able to find their domain um, and get a retrievable, uh, a verifiable path. And so that same solution is, is going to be used for ads.cert. Curtis, you want to add to that? Yeah, to, to add a little bit to that. So, uh, some of the, so we've been looking at uh, the different intervention points that we can uh, have some sort of signaturing mechanism uh, in this process. And there's really three main points um, where we could introduce the standard. One would be, of course, on the bid request that was being sent out, like what was um, uh, documented with that cert proposal. Um, another location would be to uh, have a challenge. You can think of it almost as, as like a buyer challenge, where the buyer is sending a challenge back to the publisher saying, you are claiming you are Pandora.com, but uh, when you're going to actually try to fetch this creative, prove it to me that you're Pandora uh, by by signing the creative fetch uh, portion of the uh, of this dialogue. Um, and then finally, the third opportunity that we uh, have been discussing is having uh, some sort of offline settlement process where you, uh, after the fact, go and, uh, and uh, try to uh, get a, um, a verification from the publisher that they are who they say they are, and they did participate in that transaction. So um, there's uh, multiple, uh, multiple opportunities for us to uh, add more security to this process, and it's an interesting, challenging problem so if, any, if anyone wants to help us participate, or participate in um, designing this for the industry, then uh, it's a, a large opportunity. Any other questions? Any other questions? No? OK. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick, Kurt. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so I think now um, we have um, we have the opportunity to have um, kind of a panel discussion. But I think really what makes sense uh, is since we've covered so many so many topics, is just opening up to a town hall style uh, conversation. So um, we covered a lot of topics, and maybe you had a question and didn't ask it. Um, and so now I think what makes sense is just opening up. So we covered a lot of ground today. Um, we covered, oh geez, <laughs> um, we covered uh, um, app ads txt, we covered the seller's JSON supply chain object, um, we covered 
um, AdCom, uh, AdCert, OMSDK. Um, we covered uh, rewarded ads, um, and we covered uh, how the ad tech ecosystem works. So at this point, um, and in the context of supply chain and how we communicate all of these things through real-time bidding or uh, over automated guaranteed channels, um, let's open up to, to some of the questions. I think what would also be interesting to hear is um, who is in the process of adopting what? So, um, uh, you know, if you're asking a question, it'd be interesting to hear what you're working on as well. Um, so I also would encourage anyone who has any interesting stories of what you worked on, whether or not you've participated in the working groups. Uh, I think it, we'd all love to hear from, from you and your stories. Um, so, Lizzie, if you want to <laughs> help run. Everyone jump in right away. <laughs> So I'll uh, talk a little bit about AppAds.txt. So uh, one of the uh, one of the things we found with Ads.txt is that uh, publishers have some anxiety about uh, adopting an Ads.txt file on their site. So uh, it's something where it's either it's an all or none proposition. If you publish an Ads.txt file on your site, it's going to affect your monetization. And if you have an error in that file, then it could take some amount of time to uh, to correct that problem. Problem, and you're relying on uh, all of the different participants in the ecosystem going out and recrawling that ads.txt file so that you um, have the uh, corrected uh, uh, seller information updated for your domain. So that's one of the areas that we're um, looking at as uh, trying to improve that uh, process to reduce the publisher anxiety about publishing an ads.txt file and make it so that um, they're comfortable uh, with with trying to publish the file. Um, we, uh, for our platform, of course, uh, we're, we're only able to, uh, uh, to, to make those improvements on uh, our platform, but it'd be great to uh, be able to have a, kind of a common set of uh, user interface and uh, uh, expectations that a uh, publisher uh, has, of course, across all of the different platforms that are going to be crawling outside text files so that um, there's a, uh, a, a, a expectation for a, a cadence of crawling so that a publisher will know when any corrections that they make to their files are going to be uh, updated within the, all of the systems that are crawling them. So I was curious to hear if anyone else had any uh, uh, experiences with uh, this, with this publisher anxiety of uh, publishing the files and uh, in any support issues that that uh, has brought up. How many app publishers are in the room? Pandora. <laughs> Good. Uh, and how many of the app publishers have posted their app ads TXT files? Oh, come on. <laughs> so now you've got some homework if it's not already in your sprint planning. <laughs> well, why, why? Tar oh, targeting this quarter? Okay, cool. So, um, how many have been posted is the question. Uh, I think 300, two? Do you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> ha how do we get more publishers to do things? Yeah, I mean, like if I'm a, a small publisher in Brazil, and there's five people in my network, I mean, I can have a website. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the, <laughs> you're asking for a friend, right? Um, there's the carrot and there's the stick. So you, you want to appeal to everyone to do it. You want to make it easy. So if you have a mobile ad network, uh, you may want to try to provide UI or whatever mechanisms to make it easy for them to do it. Um, I think someone is already working on providing a, a, a web hosting for specifically for those who don't have a web domain. Um, but then in the end, it's going to be money, right? If we as buyers and the advertisers and agencies start directing the money to participating, there's going to be incentives for everyone, including the long tail, to adopt it. So it is a little bit of both. We need to encourage them. Money needs to talk.
Exactly, but in that case, it's fairly easy to deploy it too, because assuming, worst case, they just have to put a, a domain up and then put a, a simple file with one record in it. For example, if you are an AdMob publisher, then that's all you use. You just need to put one line into your adsoc.txt file. So it's actually quite simple. Yes, you need to have a domain, but it's, monetization isn't, isn't a right, it's a privilege, right? And if you're not willing to do something, well, then you can't expect to get to maximize your monetization. We all have to contribute to fight fraud, and even the app developers have to do part of the burden here. For, from what I see, the number one source of spooked inventory is in-app game video. Uh, and if people think they're buying a particular app and they're not, they're just feeding some uh, criminal organization who's creating bid requests out of thin air, it's definitely in their best interest to, uh, to, to support app ads.txt. Um, getting to the question about how much are out there, there was a huge spike last week. Uh, it, it definitely got off to a slow start. There were a couple of large app makers uh, who, who were uh, who supported initially the, in in a couple of cases? These were people who also have fairly uh, well-trafficked web properties. But now we're starting to see that various uh, uh, intermediaries are starting to push on the on the app makers to publish because they recognize that they're leaking money out of their income stream as well by having apps that don't have app ads text files. I would also encourage anybody that's a buyer to push on your buying platform to support this as soon as possible. It's key, it's key for, for the app developers to realize that the primary uh, people who lose money on fraud is not the advertiser, it's the publishers. Because there's money that should go to the publishers. So if someone wants to spend, a, Nike wants to spend a million dollars with the New York Times or a Pandora, and uh, half of that goes to the fraudsters, That's why we all need to evangelize this. Right? We started pitching this back in December in Europe, uh, and we just all need to beat the drum every day, everywhere we can. Uh, we, and I'm assuming that uh, all the other participants were seeing similar, uh, we saw a very, very rapid um, dollar-weighted basis uh, adoption of, uh, of ads.txt uh, on uh, to the point where uh, it was probably one of the fastest growing launches that we've, um, that we've seen on our platforms. And so yeah, I think it's it, once we get the uh, critical mass, especially of, uh, of the uh, larger, well-established, high uh, monetization uh, uh, apps on, on the platform uh, adopting this, then uh, we, we should see this start to snowball. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing to ads.txt. It caught everybody by surprise how quickly adoption ramped. Nobody expected, I, I don't think anybody expected it to ramp as quickly as it did. Uh, also, you'll see articles out there that say that only 60% or 50% or whatever the article says the adoption rate for ads.txt is. For programmatic, it's way above 90 no, no matter what you're reading for stuff that's being transacted programmatically, it's super high. My, fa my favorite is the stats of how many of Alexa top thousand have published it. Not everyone on Alexa top thousand have ads, <laughs> right? So. And if anyone wants to uh, have a further discussion about implementing uh, ads.txt crawlers or any of the behind the scenes uh, tech uh, that, that uh, and uh, some of the lessons learned that we've had uh, from this on Google, I'd be happy to discuss this later. I'm currently working on uh, revamping our ads.txt crawling pipeline and trying to get us to the point where we can do uh, real-time recrawls on, uh, on publisher requests of the sites and uh, improve uh, some of the UX around uh, the experience. Awesome. Any other comments, questions, burning 
bragging rights that you're halfway done with your OpenRTB3 implementation? What's so funny? <laughs> um, yes, John, awesome. Actually, I'm just curious, is there any place we can go to kind of watch the adoption rate of all of these initiatives? I mean, um, like, you're we're talking about ads.txt, which is the, the hot thing that's happening right now, but then, like, uh, ad apps and then, of course, you know, the things that are still, um, you know, in beta or in progress. I'd love to see a roadmap. I'd love to see adoption rates, kind of, of, of all of these anti-fraud things and, um, that the IAB is um, sponsoring. Yeah, I, I think internally within our Slack channel, we have uh, uh, published um, some of these stats. But it, I, yeah, I, I agree. It, I think it would be great to have the IAB Tech Lab publish externally on a regular basis, um, kind of the adoption. So one of the things you'll find is if you look at adoption on a count of the number of domains or uh, or some, some sort of non-weighted basis, you'll find that uh, adoption rate doesn't look as impressive, but when you actually look at it on uh, on bid requests or on uh, uh, on dollars transacted, you find uh, that it is uh, much more heavily weighted towards uh, 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 towards the publishers who have adopted the standard because they're the ones who have uh, a lot more money to lose if uh, if there's fraud happening on their platform. Uh, AppAds.txt is where we're paying the most attention right now to see what adoption looks like. Uh, we talked with Jen and Sam at the Tech Lab about trying to make some of this information available. I'd like to believe that that you know it, it can become very transparent. The the difficulty right now, as I mentioned earlier, is getting uh, information out of the iOS App Store. Um, right now, you have to have some sort of metadata provider or you have to implement a scraping uh, crawler. I don't think anybody wants to do that, but uh, it, it, that information is super valuable and if a couple of us have it, I think it's in the best interest of everybody that everybody has a list of where to look for the app ads.txt files for particular apps. Uh, um, and then it just comes down to what Curtis was talking about before, which is how frequently you call, how frequently you crawl the ads.txt files. Uh, I, I can also say for supply chain, the, the trade desk is going to push really hard on this. Uh, our current belief is in Q3 that we will only do business with intermediaries that have published this. Uh, uh, so th that's our goal. We're, we're going to work towards that. We believe that if 20% of intermediaries didn't publish, it would be okay for us. Uh, uh, and we hope that, that will help with adoption. It would be amazing if someday Google can make the same sort of pledge from DBM. Not to put you on the spot. And something else that we want to do is we want to make it transparent to the advertiser, to the, the advertiser agencies who are looking at the reports uh, to be able to see who was, like, what was the actual domain that um, we verified when we were checking the authorization status of that inventory. So, for example, if we crawled um, our app store, if we crawled a third-party app store and we found Pandora.com was the developer domain behind uh, the app that was associated with these ad requests, we want to make that Pandora.com domain visible to the advertiser so that the advertiser is able to see, hey, I'm buying genuine Pandora.com uh, ad inventory because uh, Google is showing that here I've, uh, I, that, that this was the domain, the actual domain that was verified. And one way you can almost think of it is, is uh, the the user interface could be like a tree showing here's the domains that uh, were authorizing this inventory and then expand each of those domains and you can see okay well for pandora.com you've got this amount of uh, impressions from um, the pandora app on 
Play Store, this amount for the uh, Pandora app on uh, iOS, this amount on Roku, and so on. So uh, it really makes an opportunity to have the developer's domain be the um, like the first class um, um, uh, identity uh, to to represent the underlying uh, app inventory. Um, I think there's a couple of SSPs or exchanges in the room. Um, do you guys want to raise your hand if you are in the process of uh, or will be in the process of uh, putting up a salary's JSON file? Oh, cool. Awesome. So that's at least three, four people. I think that's good. There's one right now out there. So we have one. You got to start somewhere. It just published on Thursday. Wait, that's not AdsWiz. Whose is it? A uh, tap accelerator, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a good time to point out too. So, if uh, if it's unclear how the magic of public comment works, um, you can just um, there's an email uh, like when you go find the spec, there's an email on it. Email that that uh, email alias um, or join the working group and then uh, make your comments known, and we'll review everything. Public comments are open for another 27 days or something. And uh, and uh, we'll be finalizing it, and then that's once the spec is final. That's when we really push for adoption. Um, I predict 27 days from now we'll have 20 sellers.json files published, at least, because I'm working on at least 15 of those, <laughs> trying to get the sellers that we've stopped buying from that want to do business with us. This is their path. And if any, if it, like I said earlier, if anyone um, is interested in participating in these working groups, then we're uh, definitely happy to have uh, others involved. Uh, it's been uh, uh, very, uh, I found it a very interesting uh, process to be participating in, uh, in uh, helping with these specifications. Awesome. Um, any other questions? Comments, concerns, town hall stuff. Okay, awesome. So uh, we will um, thank you to all of our speakers, all of our panel panel helpers. Thank you guys. Um, and then just before we close, a couple more notes um, to give you some action items so you can keep uh, staying involved. My colleague Colleen is going to help you understand what what tech lab membership is and other stuff. Hi there. So if you're in the room today, it's a 95% chance that you're an IAB Tech Lab a member, and that means you can participate in our working groups. Um, you don't need permission from anyone to join a working group other than from yourself. If you are a member company, you can join. Um, you can join by just going to iabtechlab.com, clicking on working groups, see the suite of groups that we are uh, focused on for 2019 and then just shoot an email to techlab at iabtechlab.com. We'll get you registered. If you're a manager or a group of uh, folks at your company and you'd like to get them engaged across our initiatives, uh, hit me up at the same email address. I'll send you a member grid for your whole organization. You can see who is and isn't participating, inclusive of IAB and IAB Tech Lab membership. We really want you to get engaged. Tech Lab working groups are highly technical, geared towards product and engineering folks, but we allow you to just join and sit and listen like a fly on the wall because eventually you will become participatory in the future at some point in your career. Um, it also gives you access to meeting notes, Slack channels, and other great insider tips. Pretty much the conversations today that everyone is promoting are happening there on those working groups, those Google Docs, the Slack channels, and we really encourage you to engage. Um, lastly, uh, I had some notes to myself. Um, if you'd like to do an engagement call with IAB or IAB Tech Lab, I'm happy to work with you and whoever at your organization to just go through what it is Tech Lab's doing, our roadmap, why it should matter to you and your company, and make sure that you're aligning and, and getting enrolled in our work groups and really making the best of your membership, and also educating your teams and elevating them to be the most resourceful they can with, with your tech stack as well. Um, and last but not least, if you enjoyed today's event, in New York on May 6th, we're doing uh, a similar event, but fully programmed full day uh, innovation day on supply chain in programmatic um, and we have lots more to talk about on that stage. Jennifer, you want to talk about that yeah. event a little bit? There's going to be lights, there's going to be sound effects, there's going to be trans transition effects on the PowerPoints. 
Um, I don't, maybe. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, uh, the event agenda is posted. We're gonna dive a little bit more into fraud. We're gonna talk more about, we kind of hinted at like this reconciliation thing. We're gonna talk about what the future of that is. Talk about um, some of these like technology leadership level items. Um, it, it does cost a little bit more money than today's event costed. Um, but there might be more beer, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, if you or your um, team members, teammates want to join us for that event, um, we can tell you more about it or you can look it up at iabtechlab.com slash events. And it's May 6th in New York City. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, so I think that wraps up today's content. Um, but uh, I would encourage us to all hang around and uh, continue the conversation, maybe one on one uh, or in, in small groups um, before we uh, I let you go, because uh, there's some beverages back there. Um, I just want to thank Pandora and all of our speakers again. But Lizzie, thank you for, for organizing and, and helping us get here and opening the doors for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pandora. And thank you again to all of our speakers and OpenRTB leaders. Uh, and thank you to all of you for showing up. This is really cool to see. A, I think it was a packed house. I know a couple of people left because they're not cool enough, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> boo. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was really nice to see a bunch of uh, awesome, attentive faces. So thank you. Um, I guess. Here's something fun. Uh, if you want to break break the ice, uh, if you want to talk about ad cert, uh, maybe come over here while you uh, have a beer in your hand. Uh, if you want to talk about ads txt, maybe go to that stage thing over there. Um, and if you want to talk about adcom rewarded ads or OMSDK, maybe hang out in that corner or not. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, before we, uh, do you have any? I suggest we uh, pile up the white chairs to make more room for us to walk yes. around and have a happy hour. Yes, let's. Small thing, but that'll make it easier. That's great. Let's uh, make it efficient. Thank you all so much. Hang around. Thank you. Just for a quick moment.